we live? There we go. We're live. All right. Well, uh, this morning should prove to be a, a unique and fun review, I expect. Uh, uh, before, I'd like to give a brief introduction. Um, oh, and Nick, um, I've had this question from a couple people. Uh, where can students find the link to the live review? If you click live on YouTube in top left, you can click copy streaming link. And that'll be in everyone's link? Everyone's yeah. uh, okay, right. Yeah, everyone should be able to see that. All right, great. Well, hello to our anonymous uh, YouTube audience. And this morning, um, I'd like to give a brief introduction to the, uh, the studio. This review is carried out and uh, will be carried out in two really separate, uh, almost separate um, sub studios in a way that the studio is divided into two halves, one a collective group project <clears throat> in which the entire studio collaborated um, on a single exercise, and then a second phase of the project, which uh, involved individual projects and smaller group projects. And, and those two uh, shared a lot um, of overlap in, um, in uh, method and topic uh, and so on, <clears throat> but were uh, discontinuous in terms of the actual work product. But before jumping in, I want to give a brief introduction. I think most of you know all our reviewers, but um, uh, even as a formality, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, um, our reviewers. Some of you may know, some of you may not. Um, Bruce, I think probably everyone knows you, Bruce. Um, uh, but uh, I'll, I, I will say Bruce um, has an extraordinary uh, uh, range and depth of experience um, and has uh, um, beginning in uh, with graduating uh, magna cum laude from Stanford to be in architecture in, um, what was that, 1910? Little humor. Uh, was uh, it that century? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm 122, so okay. uh, I think I look pretty good for my age. Yeah, well, it, uh, the, and since then has accomplished uh, enough um, to be fit a, a a degree from 1910, uh, including um, winning the AA school medal at UCLA, um, various other distinctions, uh, the thesis prize, um, fellowships, and uh, worked for a range of offices uh, <clears throat> um, before starting his own practice and, and now, of course, teaching uh, in the third year core currently at Tulane. Um, we also have uh, I believe you, everyone knows better than anyone, I suppose, but uh, Nick Lacoste uh, joining us. We're very fortunate. He knows the project well and has helped many of you in, in, in all uh, manner, but um, I will say has uh, a degree, uh, a Bachelor of Architecture from New Jersey Institute of Technology, um, where he worked on a range of, uh, uh, or studied a range of technologies, not limited architectural, various forms of digital design. I uh, took some great studios, including a solar decathlon. Um, and before moving to New York uh, and to work for a firm and then later to here. Um, we have uh, also um, joining us as well, I think you all know Carrie Norman, um, but Carrie Norman uh, has uh, architecture degrees from University of Virginia and a master's degree from Princeton, licensed in New York and Louisiana, and uh, has a background teaching at New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, Columbia, Barnard, University of Pennsylvania, and elsewhere, and has her own uh, practice, a collaborative practice based in New York and um, Chicago, uh, which has won a wide range of awards and has done fantastic projects. We also have joining us um, uh, as well, um, uh, uh, Riley Lacali. Riley, am I saying your last name right? I realize I've never said your last name in my life. You're muted. You're right. It's the Collie. You got it. Okay. Um, well, uh, Riley is um, a graduate originally of University of Washington uh, with a degree in architecture, um, but recently, in, uh, was it two years ago, completed a master's degree here at Tulane, where um, Riley worked on uh, uh, a number of projects with me, including a, a small center uh, design build in 2018 and uh, a mural on uh, Tropatus and Julia Street, um, where uh, Riley, if, if you weren't the project manager, then there wasn't a project manager for that project. Um, and really instrumental um, in all of them, and, and a, a true, uh, I don't know the term exactly, but a, a 
crack team member. Um, solve problems, and I, I'm really glad you're on the review. I need to go a little faster, uh, I suppose, but uh, last but not least, um, we have Maria, also a, a graduate, um, undergraduate uh, from Tulane University, where Maria um, uh, led, is that the correct term, the DOL, um, was perhaps Nick before Nick, um, uh, and uh, is now a master's student um, at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Um, and also, I believe, working on a range of independent projects, or at least at least I know of one independent project um, in the city of New Orleans. Um, I forgot to mention too, sorry, I, I skipped over my notes, but Riley uh, is, will be um, not currently, I believe, but starting tomorrow at Chadburn and Doss Architects. Is that correct, Riley? Or yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay. Um, so uh, a, a fantastic panel. I'm really, I'm really grateful to all of you and uh, um, representing a great range of experience, which is again, really appropriate to this. This is, um, a, a, I'm gonna assume that um, you've read the briefs and the students will give you a, a full introduction, but a few comments from me first. Um, one is that generally with um, design build type projects in which the whole studio works together, uh, there's often, it's often a challenging conversation because it doesn't fit the normal review. Each student presents and um, has a project with an idea that you can rip apart or celebrate or somewhere in between um, because it remains speculative and ongoing with the design pill project. There's a beginning and there's an end and it's out there in the world. Um, and a lot of energy goes into just figuring out, um, you know, uh, what time to meet your classmates to work on something physically and that actual coordination is not presented, right? That kind of group me, can we meet at seven? No, I've got class kind of thing. Um, so that, to some degree, this review is a celebration of the work that is completed on this um, and uh, an, an acknowledgement of that work. Um, <clears throat> it's also uh, that the challenges of a normal design build studio are compounded this semester uh, for some obvious reasons. Uh, we had, uh, uh, what is it, a, um, a pandemic in which there were social distancing constraints. So to do a collaborative design build project uh, and staying six feet apart, uh, reviewing as a studio, all of these things were enormous challenges. Um, we um, tragically had the loss of Sam recently, which, um, which really this semester revealed to me just how instrumental he was not only in make, providing access to the tools, um, and training on the tools, but also uh, the knowledge and enthusiasm he brought with that. Um, and that was a huge loss. Every time I've worked in the shop, there's always, that's been a sort of source of momentum for any project. Um, and, and it was very much a challenge this semester. There were also a couple of hurricanes thrown in um, for good measure, um, students going in and out of quarantine. So uh, I think that the students have, um, you will see, have worked, just accomplished a remarkable amount, um, uh, more than perhaps they, they, they'll reveal over time, uh, I think, to them. Uh, and they, so some of this, again, should be an acknowledgement of that. But then there's also the matter of uh, um, the pedagogy and the, the brief. So I'm going to share my screen uh, briefly. You've, you may have seen this, uh, but the studio is titled No Standards. It's a research studio, um, uh, one of several um, uh, here running this semester and, and at Tulane, which is a somewhat new format and a fantastic format, I think, for the students to uh, engage in research focused research topics. And this studio is no standards, of course, um, which is essentially, I will summarize, um, <clears throat> uh, questioning, probing, exploring, interrogating, and so forth, the, um, <clears throat> the state in which we find ourselves today. Um, in architecture and in construction in which almost everything is standardized, right? Every unit of measurement, um, of course, but also, um, you know, and of course, you know, two by fours, building products, um, but just everything uh, almost has become um, a building product and, uh, and therefore standardized. And that has brought with it um, wonderful things. We can go um, and, and, you know, know that uh, if we by uh, a piece of wood, um, a piece of lumber rather, uh, we don't have to measure it and, and calibrate it. Uh, but also comes with it a sort of devil's bargain that uh, all of the, the process of standardization is now uh, occurs away from the work that is done on site and the work that is done by the architect. And for, for example, two by fours 
um, of course, come from logs, from natural lumber, um, in which uh, there's an amazing amount of technology, uh, literally CAT scanning and, and x-rays that go into um, scanning logs to produce uh, the most efficient possible combination of two by fours. Um, but something is lost in that, of course, a lot is lost in that um, uh, travel distances, um, you know, in which we're shipped from forests um, and everything from uh, travel distances to uh, the fact that it's inherently inefficient. So there's this diagram is sort of the, the point of departure for the studio that shows um, in the, the 18th um, uh, or the 1700s, I guess, around the, the turn of the century, um, these uh, <clears throat> branches, these forks and trees were prized pieces of lumber because they were those mo the strongest possible uh, joint um, for shipbuilding. And so that these issues, this question of kind of like where the state we find ourselves in today when um, of this kind of enormous standardization, the uh, legacy of uh, uh, modern architecture, which perhaps even fetishize industrialization and standardization and a kind of critical assessment of that in terms of uh, waste streams um, that we are we don't see and also a loss of kind of craft on site and so forth. So that, that was a prompt. Um, and again, it was very much a uh, an exploration rather than um, uh, into these topics, and, and especially the first lesson, which I'll put on the screen now, was um, handed to the students to, uh, by me, to um, initiate this conversation um, and task them with building something difficult, uh, something using standard materials uh, to build non-standard geometries. And the task was to build a hill of beans. And this was the terminology we used, literally, uh, that I I assigned was beans. And each student was tasked with fabricating a bean and uh, that had certain criteria, basically bean like shape, be made out of blue foam and use the CNC machine. Um, and that it'd be approximately the size of a four year old child. Um, and that was the extent really of, of the constraints other than that these had to then later be assembled. Um, and the students were tasked with um, dividing uh, and, and conquering, defining um, everything from joinery to uh, finishes and so forth. And so throughout, um, there's a couple themes. Um, one, of course, is good job, <laughs> as I said before, which I, I, I think that should come first in many cases. But one is um, uh, the clarity uh, in which, by which the, the students were able to identify and subdivide a task is kind of very practical uh, questions. Uh, this is a, a sort of subsequent brief uh, that has to identify the problem, research the problem, define, articulate the problem within an individual group. Um, but also some emergent themes of the translation between idealized digital forms. Uh, we'll, we often model a two by four as a two by four or you know, 1.5 by um, 3.5 and so forth and know that it will work um, or that it's close enough. Uh, and we ignore the tolerances in those assemblies or at least have a, a good understanding because it's so simple. In this case, uh, questions of the translation between digital and uh, physical became enormous challenges. These idealized forms that are very easy to make in Rhino, click, 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 and you have a bean in Rhino. And then uh, days, months later, uh, you know, struggle to realize that physically. Um, some back and forth between the two, uh, exchange of information across uh, teams working to assemble between digital and physical. Um, sometimes some work would be accomplished physically uh, uh, and so forth um, and have to be translated back into digital and the question of tolerance. So I've, I've stated a broad outline of issues here and I think these are all open to discussion. And lastly, um, I would say that, again, I would encourage kind of dialogue and conversation. I've asked the students to present um, for 45 minutes, um, but if this were an in-person review, I would really encourage that this become much more of a conversation, um, maybe not quite a science fair formatting fully, but much more of a dialogue um, and to uh, an opportunity to reflect and assess. Um, any questions uh, from the reviewers? I've gone along for the first time. Um, uh, then with that, let's jump into it. I'm gonna make sure screen sharing is on. Um, and I believe I, I'm, the students will introduce themselves. Um, you can see their names, but introduce themselves as they're presenting. Uh, and I just reiterate that this first project represents the entire studio, but I'm handing off, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, to you, Lauren Jennings. 
Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Lauren Jennings. And as Professor Modisit said, we are a studio dedicated to the exploration of non-standard fabrication processes in a standardized construction world. This presentation is the accumulation of work done by all the studio, mostly in the first half of the semester. You can go to the next slide. To uh, reiterate what Professor Montezet has said, we are questioning the role of the existing framework that can be acknowledged in the home industry, uh, the home improvement industry, claiming to offer DIY support and solutions for said homeowners or craft enthusiasts. Um, but looking at the built environment in recent centuries, it says otherwise. We see that the pendulum has swung towards commodified industrialization and away from local and personalized craft. This observation is significant to the studio's mission because in the event that you want to do something unique from the standardized process of construction, such as two by four structures, um, it is really, really difficult because of how ingrained standardized materials are in the construction industry. So while standardized materials make things affordable and accessible, they devalue the human element in building or fabricating. You can go to the next slide. This exploration does not intend to answer a specific question, as Professor Modisit said, um, it rather explores the subtle challenges faced when wanting to make something different. So we, as a studio of 13, were tasked with exploring these processes and establish standardized frameworks through the fabrication and assembly of so-called beans. Um, for example, this is our own kind of unique framework that we created. Um, and these beans really force us to create a sequential logic with irregularity that we rarely work with as architecture students and architects. Um, next slide. These beans were digitally modeled by each studio member and are representative objects that allow us to explore materials dissociated from the strictness of standardized parts. Next. And lastly, working with forms that are irregular and organic has allowed us to connect building back to traditional methods. And we can connect these processes to areas where building materials are scarce and they must work with whatever they find. So we can go into the CNC process, I believe, with Jesse. Hi, I'm Jesse. Um, I am going to get us started about talking about fabricating the beans. Um, this process uh, of these beans, as Professor Modisip had said, is intended to be an abstraction of the problems and uh, the questions that are that arise when you're using when you're avoiding such standard materials. Um, so one when we were creating these beans, the non standard objects um, and using the standard materials because they're what surround us in the the world of making. Um, the first thing that we did was making the beans as Lauren and Adam had mentioned. Uh, each student was tasked with modeling and creating these idealized forms. Um, and to get them out of the digital space and bring them into the physical world where we could interact with them, we were limited by the materials that were available to us, there's really no way to take a hunk of bean and then mold it into what we wanted. Um, and as such, we sliced them up and cut them out of three inch thick uh, insulation foam on the CNC router. Um, and during each of these steps of translation, there were questions of tolerance and how accurate these cuts needed to be um to to allow the final the, the final object that was tangible to accurately reflect what had been digitally created um, in doing so there were trade-offs given um, for instance uh, by prioritizing having more beans done more quickly um, we sacrificed some efficiency of nesting in the four by eight sheets um, and all of this to allow the pieces of the smaller beans to get done faster so that the, the, they could then be assembled and painted simultaneously. 
And with that, I'm going to hand off to Eli. Um, yeah, so the next step was uh, to kind of go from the slices to, to process and assemble them into the full beans. Uh, so next slide, please. And so we initially tested um, a, a lot of different methods for adhering the slices um, because while the foam is a standard building material, um, it's not really designed for adhering to itself and it's it's, it's difficult to make it uh, structurally sound um, just adhered to itself and not to other materials. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the most difficult part of this was kind of adhering the end slices uh, because of their thinness, they would uh, peel and we had to find ways to eliminate that movement um, between the slices to 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 have a better tolerance of the of the digital geometry. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, next. Yeah, and then just the other slices um, had to be sanded and processed, but they were easier to work with. And then uh, next. And so the fixture was really important for aligning the slices. Um, and we did several prototypes of it. Um, the, the precision from the digital to physical came from having the holes uh, CNC'd into the slices so that um, they would align exactly between each slice and uh, with the fixture. And then the fixture was also important for having um, a point of reference in physical space to, to reference points on the bean uh, later in the process. Uh, next. So then for the actual adhesion, uh, we ended up using a, a combination of spray and construction adhesives um, to re reliably hold the bean together without uh, movement um, and have accuracy to the original geometry. Next. And then this is just showing um, the assembly on the fixture and the different types of slices and the gluing process. Next. And back to Lauren. OK, so the question for finishing was, how can conventional finishing tools be applied to various irregular surface conditions? You can go to the next slide. And the process of finishing isn't just a matter of figuring out how to paint the beans. It is rather an exploration of the number of layers you need. And those layers even included the sanding process that helped transform the physical bean to a quality that represents the digital model. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And there are layers of materials, but more significantly, these processes um, help attain that idealized surface. You can go to the next slide. And there are product specifications along the way that did not directly relate to our problem in painting foam beans, but so there was no really like singular solution. Um, some of the materials ate the foam, some were too toxic. Some were too difficult to apply. And while there are many options and opportunities for testing out there, we had to kind of balance the trade off with each solution. You can go to the next slide. Uh, for example, in the physical paint testings, uh, actually go back to the previous slide. There were kinds of ridges, and those were considered bad for the overall finishing quality. Uh, so elements of shiny versus matte were considered when figuring out how to conceal these issues of tolerance on the surface. Um, next slide. Uh, sourcing was not limited to one store. This exercise overlaps with model making and interior finishing. And for example, these are the final four processes tested with those layers of um, finishing. Next slide. And all these layers really matter to reach our standard of a smooth enough surface, which means replicating that digital quality again uh, in the physical world. Next slide. So along the way, we explored places such as Home Depot and even local art stores. Uh, but in this unique process of construction, it was important to note that we encountered and familiarized ourselves with the many scales of construction, whether it's working with model making or interior wall finishing. So this overlapping exercise just goes to reiterate that in the fabrication process, uh, there's going to be many scales that are encountered when working with non-standard. Uh, next slide. You can keep going through these. Yeah, and these are some examples of the tolerance issues that we had to uh, address. Next. 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 
So, okay, stop here. Um, when choosing colors, we had some fun with the color selection process and we drew some of our inspiration from Wes Anderson. And next slide. Um, even in that process, we found that there was standardization existing at this level um, because at paint stores, it wasn't too long ago when architects or painters had to really own, mix their own paints and Pantone wasn't around. So that was just a level of standardization that we experienced in the finishing process of the beans. Um, next. Hi, uh, my name is Gabrielle Pro, and I'm briefing on the bean aggregation section. The section encompasses bean assemblies. Um, we developed various strategies to create logic when we found lack thereof. Next. Next. This text was seemingly difficult since there's no natural order to the beans, and there were numerous issues that coupled with creating these clusters. Next, we found we needed to find some sort of rigor when attaching them. Next, logically, we began by stacking the largest beans in the bottom. As we develop more clusters, we form simulations in order to generate forms. We used various modeling softwares and used various shapes that seemed to dismiss the logic or even gravity. Next. Various modeling softwares don't make connecting beans simple. There are existing te techniques in connecting regularized blocks. However, none exist in connecting irregular shapes. Next, we can play this video. <laughs> maybe we can't. <laughs> okay, we can maybe uh, maybe someone else can just pull it up. Yeah, um, as a video and. <clears throat> There's also multiple of those ones, right? So maybe one of the other ones works. Yeah. yeah. As Adam says, you can't just snap, snap, snap irregular beans together. However, there are existing tools where you can just snap, snap, snap rectangles together. Um, so <laughs> Do you want to um, exit the, the PDF and just open up the link that's embedded? Is this on Google Slides? It's on Google Slides. So it should have been, should be fine. Um, you can, if you click on it and then click like the video format, if you escape, go back to like Google Slides, format options. Video playback, and then you can click. You can click the link that's there. Oh, hmm. Let's see. I guess in the meantime, if someone could load these, not. the links. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Gabrielle, do you have these videos that you would be able to share? Yep. Let me pull them. Okay. Sorry. You can um, take over, you can all take over each other's screen. So Gabrielle, if you just start sharing. Yeah, let me just- You'll yeah. take over from Jesse and Jesse, if you start sharing. Okay. They're playing, I have them working on my screen right now. If you okay, yeah, yeah, so just Sean, just share. Yeah, share Sean. Okay. And... Are you still presenting, Gabrielle? I was just, yeah, letting the video play. All right. 
Okay, next. Back to Jesse. Driving. I'm coming. Okay. Um, if tools don't even exist in order to attach irregular forms, how can it be effortless for anyone to work with non-standard materials? And you can just skip the video. I think everyone gets a gist of what they are. Hi, I'm Jorge. Um, so after all these previous processes, uh, it was decided that the next step uh, was to mock up the first one-to-one -one assembly. And uh, these are some photos of what actually happened uh, during the assembly. And um, next, please. And as you can see, some problems were encountered, uh, such as like uh, with lateral forces, point locating issues, and some missing points. Next. And because of this, um, the next logical step was to like zoom in into the individual beings and like study uh, their taxonomy, uh, meaning uh, learning about their character and associating their individual physical properties. Next. So uh, this logic gave us uh, the stacking assembly in which uh, no connection points are used and the assembly relies purely on the beam taxonomy and the overall equilibrium. Next, please. And um, these are some of the iterations that we went through. Next. So uh, basically the um, assembly with no connection suggested uh, uh, the need to make use of the physical model uh, to uh, study different iterations of assemblies and that took into account uh, gravity, tension, and the respective beam uh, taxonomy. Uh, next. Uh, throughout this process of working with the 3D printed beams, uh, different typologies of assembles emerged, uh, as you can see, and uh, these are some of the classifications. Uh, next, please. Next. Thank you. Um, and so through the looking at the failures of the first assembly and uh, the small scale models, we found that differently positioned connections such as uh, tension, gravity, and shear connections had different strength requirements and in some cases didn't actually need to be uh, directly connected. And so we applied these uh, lessons to make a, a more complex, uh, a more structurally complex assembly that would also still be more stable. Um, okay, so I'm Sean. Um, and after doing the constructing of the individual beans and um, designing these structures and assemblies of them, um, the points at which the beans would actually have to connect to each other needed to be transferred from the uh, digital model versions to the physical beans. Next. Um, there's where we are in that process. And, um, and so these are ex examples of um, the connection points we're talking about. Next. Um, and uh, so these are models um, from the assembly process um, that were taken to convert these points into markings on the beans in real life. Next. Um, and so like in standard construction, um, one, uh, one might just measure along edges to find connection spots um, in places to put things together. But here on these shapes without any like natural orientation, um, even a straight line measuring tape becomes useless. Um, so we had to think through a lot of different logics um, through these prototypes um, to getting to these points in 3D space. Um, next. This is, a, um, this is another non-standard construction project um, from the Architectural Association um, that was about combining tree branches to make a truss. And they had similar issues of getting to specific points. Um, and so we kind of drew from their logic of um, of a like flat point or a flat uh, grid um, with vertical jigs that would get to those specific spots in uh, in three D space. Next, um, and so here's that logic applied to our problem um, with with uh, milling out holes in plywood and having vertical jigs um, that sit in those. Um, so the so the plywood part situates the X, Y axis, and um, then you get the vertical um, information with the jigs. Next. Um, 
uh, as kind of mentioned before, a crucial step in this is um, is having any frame of reference um, because again, they these beans resist any orientation um, or starting point. So um, we use that ground fixture, which is in the middle of the um, plywood piece to uh, kind of force a orientation and a relationship between the digital model and the physical. Um, next. Um, here's some different types of jigs we needed for different um, like heights and sizes of points. Next. Um, the setup ready to host the beans for labeling. Next. Um, and controlling all the information embedded within these point locations. Um, it required these maps, which correspond to the cut plywood. Um, and these squares are annotating the, um, the holes for just a quarter of all the points we actually had to make. Um, and next. Um, and so this is just an incredible amount of information embedded in each of these uh, point locations. Everything from jig type to use to orientation to the, X, to the actual XYZ uh, measurements. Um, so effectively organizing and maintaining these flows of information really became even its own project. Um, next. Um, here's some photos of the process. Next. Um, next. Yep. Next. Um, and you can see working between digital and physical was key the whole time here. Next. Um, so once we had uh, started transitioning this information, uh, this, this spatial information from digital to physical, um, it became apparent that there was a need to validate whether this information was accurate and to find the lapses in tolerance and where it succeeded. Um, and in doing so, um, there were a lot of, there, there are a few options, a few ways to go. The first one that we tried was scanning these beans using the 3D scanning tools available to us. Um, and we quickly found that the regular surface conditions of the bean, coupled with the highly irregular geometry that they were applied to, was kind of in the, the fuzzy gray area of the technology of uh, photogrammetric uh, 3D scanning. Um, so we then had, took it to more mechanical and uh, measurement-based validation by checking uh, different, uh, different lengths and things that we could measure in digital space and referencing that to um, ways that we could measure along the curved surfaces by using string or tape or something flexible and then measuring that with standard straight line measuring tools. Um, and what we found was that the points that were located were inconsistently uh, uh, inaccurate, where some of them would be right on, right where they needed to be, and others were off by as much as three or four inches. Um, whereas the geometry of the beans, co comparing the diameters that you can see in the bottom right of this slide, um, and similar measurements, proved that the geometry that had been created was incredibly, ha had high resolution and fidelity to what had been designed. Um, as a result, we had to shift gears into finding new ways to locate these points in space. Um, and what the one that we opted for was creating these assemblies and imitating the connections, marking them with markers, and then using that as the provided information. So um, once these points of connections were finally located, um, the unknown nature of these bean objects uh, made it necessary to come up with specific connection systems to hold them together. Um, in contrast to a standardized system where you might just know that if you have two by fours put together, you use nails and they'll hold together. Um, so in contrast to that, we really had to research and design like these connections very specifically. Next. Um, there's where that is at the end of the process. Next. Um, and so lots of, lots of testing helped us to understand what would and wouldn't work with the material and start to understand its uh, strengths. Next. 
um, and, and as well as early diagrams um, to understand the different ways that the beams could like enact force on each other and, um, and just, enact, or just uh, interact with each other. Next. Um, some early prototypes and uh, methods tested showed that um, direct like point to point connections um, wouldn't work as even the little bit of inaccuracy we expected um, can have multiplying cascading effects throughout the assembly. So when one um, connection on one bean is off, um, all the other beans it's connected to then become off and so on and so forth. Um, so therefore we needed a system with some more flexibility next. Um, and a system based around uh, tension has that flexibility. Uh, next. So, um, and similar to the way we had to adopt paint design for different things, we adopted um, a lot of hardware um, that was intended for different use, uh, uses in more standardized construction. Um, for example, drywall anchors to, um, to anchor into the foam and can create that strong uh, tension connection. Next. Um, and here you see some photos of going from on the top left, the original point markings with like the thumbtacks there um, to uh, the final connected beans. Next. And even after all the testing we did, um, we found, um, as has been mentioned, we found that we didn't fully account for or understand all the forces that these assemblies would apply on themselves. Um, at, and so like in this example, um, one issue was where all of the weight of the beans could act as kind of a big lever arm um, and exert all that on one connection, causing it to rip out. Um, next. And um, as Eli has mentioned, um, we differently arranged connections like the tension, gravity, and shear ones um, had different those different strength requirements. Um, and in some cases, no actual connection was needed. Next. Um, and so based on this understanding of the different strength required, um, we identified which connections needed strengthening and found these some longer anchors that um, hold on to more surface area in the foam. And we also enforced some of the smaller ones with epoxy. Next. Um, and these are just some photos of the connections you can flip through. Next. And next. And once we had all of the connections installed, um, it, it came the final step to really put these things together and test out the, the results. Um, and doing this in a controlled environment um, had a number, of, a, a number of strengths to it. Um, primarily, being able to do this in a controlled environment proved or what was primarily a test of its replicability and robustness. For instance, if these things can be assembled and then disassembled and reassembled um, in a different configuration, then that's a, a, a success of the, the tension system, as well as the, the assemblies being robust enough that they don't rely on precarious placements and they really, can, they really are successful in the way that they've been designed. Um, and as with any project, we, we had to address issues such as how can people actually reach these? Like we're people with arms and how do we put, put the beans where they go and things of that nature, um, as well as how do we get the beans from one place to another? Um, and there were all sorts of logistical hurdles that we had to, that we had to tackle. Um, and then we got on, onto a, an off-campus off site. Um, this is the abandoned naval base um, along the Mississippi. And I'm not going to speak over these photos. We can just pass through them.
this is a time lapse of us installing and assembling. Jake, Jesse, what was the point of the plastic and was it taken out for the final photos? It was taken you... out for the final photos. It was to preserve the fish, the finish of the beans um, hmm. on, on the asphalt. And that's, that's all from us. There's one. Uh, oh, one there is. The end. Okay. Oh no! Let me out. This is very necessary. <laughs> and this is all from us for real this time. <laughs> um. We have all of these slides are in concept board. Um, I don't know if someone has already sent that link to the Zoom chat. Jesse, why don't you put that in the com in the chat right now? Yeah. So I, I'll jump in briefly, just I, as a um, again, as, as I said in the beginning, for for the critics, there's a lot to process here, of course. Um, and I encourage you just to jump in with just uh, questions about uh, even just a clarifying process or clarifying what's going on. Um, you know, you don't have to position this immediately. Um, and certainly I expect there's some time in just kind of looking through the slides on concept board or, or, or kind of gathering all of this. Um, again, this work, I just restate, represented more than just the students who presented, but it was collective work of the studio and the students who presented, um, assembled the presentations sort of on behalf of the studio, or in some cases took the, took the work a bit farther uh, than where, than where the, the whole studio left it off. But um, um, there's a number of themes that I, that I think merit kind of probing deeper, but certainly there's a lot to grapple with here. Um, yeah, I guess I can start. Um, first off, thank you for this presentation. It was really exciting to see um, throughout the semester. Um, I'm sorry, like Maria and Riley, that you couldn't like be here this whole time seeing like the beans come together. I'm sure Riley would have been super beneficial over at Millhouse um, with this with this process and kind of being involved in this. Um, but it was really great to see uh, just kind of like the collective effort um, all coming together to produce this really incredible project. Um, I guess there was one thing I was like a little bit um, I was questioning a little bit. Uh, there was like the uh, the point making group that was creating the jigs with the plywood, and like from your presentation or your side of the presentation, it seemed like everything was was all gravy. Um, and then like afterwards, when it was like the geometry validation, it seemed like the points were off. So I was wondering if I could hear more from that group about like maybe like what I guess not what went wrong, but like how that process could have gone better? Like, is there another iteration of the jigs that could have more accurately placed those points? Could 3D scanning have been involved sooner? Or like 3D scanning was like terrible and that it didn't work out at all. Um, just curious to like, kind of like hear a little more about that. Um, and I'll start on that. And Melina and Lauren, um, who worked on this a lot, feel free to add in. Um, I think um, one of the biggest difficulties was just this, like I was mentioning, just the sheer amount of like steps and in information. Um, and there's a lot of human error possible in that. Um, for instance, it's, it's even hard to like, be sure of which way the bean is supposed to be flipped and oriented. Um, and so I think that's what, uh, what led a lot to um, like, uh, some of the a lot of the points being exactly accurate, because like the base, the basic logic of the system worked, but um, then some just randomly being off because of just human error piling up. Um, but y'all jump in um, as much as you want. 
I know. Um, so Malene and I both worked on the digital jig points and then also like the spreadsheets. And one thing um, I wasn't aware of is that the it's hard to tell when you flip a bean, which side is the <laughs> upside and which side is the flipped side, which is a large portion of how we designed the jig. And as a remote student, I didn't understand that because I wasn't seeing the beans. I wasn't holding the beans. I was just assuming, yeah, you can tell if it's flipped or not flipped. And then much later, um, I was talking to Jesse and they were like, well, it's hard to tell when the bean is flipped or not. And I was like, why didn't anyone tell me this? <laughs> I could have provided pictures of this. So I think um, a lot of times it's just making sure the bean is in the correct position. Because if it's not in the correct position, the precision of the jig will be off. And that's something that wasn't always like, I think clear what people weren't always like understand like how or what way the beans should be going just because they are non-standard and it's hard to place them in real space in relation to the digital space. Cool, yeah. I think, I think maybe a potential solution could have been maybe to like paint them with some sort of patterning system. Um, so like, I, I know they're all different colors to have them be distinguished, but maybe there's some sort of like striping or directionality where it's like maybe like a two tone where it's like a, a light blue and a dark blue signifying what's top and bottom. But even then, like there was the painting happened after the points were created because you're using the, the circles as the jig. So, I mean, I think it's a fantastic effort. Uh, I couldn't imagine being like partially remote, partially person, all this coordination, I mean, major props to Adam for having to coordinate and solve all these, work through all these issues. Um, but I didn't solve anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, the images at the end look lovely. Um, I, I think the way that these are presented in your portfolios and websites is gonna be really crucial. Um, kind of like talk about the group effort and what, what you individually contributed to have that ownership. First of all, I just, uh, I want to congratulate you all. Um, this was incredible. Uh, it's, I really, I mean, I haven't been um, teaching since 1920, which is, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I want to say, uh, I haven't seen anything like this. And I think that's really exciting. It's, definitely like kind of current and um, upcoming feels feels very um, like fresh territory. And it's also, I think you guys have all um, had tremendous extra challenges working on a kind of heavily collaborative uh, project in COVID times. But then just hearing uh, Laura McGrath speak, there may have been to some degree, maybe advantages by the remote aspect of the project because it really forced you all to um, uh, exercise your faculties of description. So the whole project is in a way an exercise in description. Um, not unlike a uh, more traditional um, architectural uh, uh, practices in like descriptive geometry, um, the types of drawings we might see with stereotomy, uh, the types of, uh, of languages like coordinates that we might find by uh, navigating by like latitudes and longitudes. So there's a real investigation in um, descriptive languages, right? Coordinates, um, whatever else. Um, but then also like that Excel spreadsheet, um, listing all of the, the coordinates, listing. I love that, that um, kind of cross section diagram showing the different types of layers, the two-sided layer, the, um, and you know, all of the, the sandwiches in between. Um, because it really forced you all to use the existing uh, conventions, use the existing kind of standards of architectural drawing, um, but also identify their limits of how they can describe, but also where they fail to describe properly um, the geometry and the solids that you're working with. And I found that to be really exciting too, because it also started to 
um, overlap with the ways in which like BIM technologies describe uh, properties of material, right? So you look at, you open up Revit and a wall is described by its um, thermal properties, its volume, um, all of these factors and properties that are um, uh, not considered in, in a traditional drafting software. So it's, it's, um, it's exciting in the way in which it's putting this project puts pressure on our existing suite of tools. And it's also using the language of architecture, but um, putting pressure on it and also kind of advancing the language. And so it's not there yet, right? So obviously the language doesn't fully exist that can describe this language. But I love that like all of these kind of hacks that you guys are developing, like the spreadsheet method, the jig method, all of these uh, uh, tools are eventually going to somehow advance and adapt into um, a way in which this work can be described. And so this is like a very important, I think, stepping stone in that process. And like any development of, of a language or any development of a working method, um, it goes through these uh, uh, initial kind of beta tests. And, and anyway, I'm, I, I don't wanna ramble, but I just wanna say this is really important work. And I, I think you've all done a tremendous job. And I saw this at the mid review. So I wanna just say it may have been a little bit, um, needling and poking you all at that moment, because I don't know, I was a little underwhelmed, but I, I will say you've made up for it since. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question. Was, was there any um, dialogue about whether you finished the individual beans after assembly, um, because it's it seemed as if you know they were all kind of covered and then painted, and then assembled, and I'm sure they were disassembled and reassembled again. Um, but as opposed to typical construction where you have your raw materials and then you finish them after assembly, um, was there any dialogue about the the kind of the steps towards the final product? Yeah, I could speak to that a little bit. Um, I think the the main reason for, for doing it before assembly was that we had uh, multiple assemblies to arrange them in. Um, and so that they would presumably keep the same finish uh, through all those assemblies. Um, but I do think we had a lot of issues with uh, damage to the finishes um, that probably could have been avoided um, by not doing that. Um, if I can jump in there, I uh, part of the finish also protected the geometry of the beans where like the, the seams, where the, the machine foam stuck together, um, if that had gotten dirt in it and then pulled apart, the, the paint and sealant act to protect that as well. Right, okay. And, and if I could say one thing, um, at least in my experience when working with them, the actual color of the paint used um, was a sort of shortcut in identifying what that bean was um, and I think that was um, one of the, the most important um, decisions made in, in painting them prior to the assembly. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that question like brought up, it is like interesting. Um, it's a really interesting like shift from like you're saying, like in typical construction, it's like all the components come together um, and they're a little bit maybe less important. Um, you know, like all the things within a wall and then you just put paint on um, outside of it. Whereas I feel like this project is celebrating maybe, I don't know if that's the right word, but like it's celebrating the actual component itself um, and then making something more of it. Um, so I think that's like an interesting change that we come upon. Um, I'm kind of curious, um, also this, this is like amazing. I'm just thinking about like me trying to fabricate something at the scale at Tulane and like when I was at Tulane. So it was like, like congratulations to y'all for sure for making all of these uh, beans. Um, 
but I was kind of curious about um, like the sort of tolerances with the geometry that y'all found when you were CNCing them. Um, like the picture of the blue foam, um, like when you were assembling the slices, there's like the middle part that doesn't have any ridges that kind of just seems flat. Um, so I was wondering if like the geometry sort of gets altered as you're stacking it and like if that um, kind of benefited y'all when you were assembling, like if that flat point was sort of easier to configure than this like more rounded uh, ridges or like, um, yeah, like if y'all could speak more to like the sort of tolerance thing. Um, yeah, I think we, we definitely like uh, smoothed and sanded the entire beam before doing anything with like um, marking points or assembling. So um, I think if we had done that, it kind of would been, would, wouldn't have truly been like a non-standard geometry. Um, if there was like differentiate, if there was differentiation um, on the surface. So, yeah. Yeah, part of this, um, I, I can, I'll jump in for a second, but part of this uh, was a constraint given from me that uh, the CNC machine could have sort of pre-drilled um, or, or otherwise provided information to locate the holes very easily. Um, the idea was that uh, the design, that all of the kind of parts you saw in that presentation, I mean, this is what I was trying to foster. Um, all the, the separate parts were occurring in parallel. So one team wasn't waiting for the other team, the, the jig and the fixtures would be in place, uh, the bean stacks could be designed, then the beans are built, and there wasn't a, um, uh, there wasn't a, a kind of predetermined way the beans came together. But those were all concurrent. And so that informed everyone's work as a sort of flexibility to presume that the other teams might produce beans of uh, unusual size or irregular shapes, <laughs> um, or that the stacking, the, the hill team would produce something unexpected um, that everyone was kind of prepared for. And, and even the finishing team, right? You had to be prepared for um, a kind of a range of possible resolutions in the CNC finish. The project seems to be like maybe just the scale somewhere between like a Jeff Kuhn sculpture and like a pile of boulders. Um, and on the one hand, like the Kuhn's is like in entirely reliant on um, standard procedures and standard um, fabrication materials, X, Y, and Z. And the other is more informal. Um, and so I guess my question is sort of to what degree is the process of the um, hill um, carefully calibrated in terms of like, are you using like physics plugins to like understand the properties of the, the beans, like the dispositions of the elements nesting together? Or is it like, really kind of more analog and more in line with the little like glue gun um, samples that you all were working on? Like, is it like kind of like guess and check or is it like heavily um, determined is the question. I think that's like a Nick, Gabby and Jorge, um, if you all wanna go in on that. Um, one, one thing that comes to mind, um, because I, I think that's an excellent question, that's something that we debated, you know, to what extent can um, these structural assemblies be um, perhaps prescribed or predicted um, through digital technology. But the thing is, when working with uh, non-standard materials, there, you know, as has been said um, previously, you know, there is a, a limited understanding of the capabilities of that material. Um, and a limited understanding of um, what possible connections might um, provide or the disadvantages without actually building it. Um, so it, it, all of that is to say that it's, it's rather challenging to predict these things digitally um, because uh, there is not enough information 
uh, to plug in to that model um, and to prescribe. And even with the uh, sort of, I hate to use this word, but rudimentary physics uh, that we did use, dumping uh, beans into a vessel um, or rearranging them, that proved to kind of circumvent um, the real issues that were later discovered by um, going in with a physical model or a full-scale one-to-one model and reassembling those. Nick, can you just describe briefly the, the rudimentary physics? Because I'm not sure everyone's even aware that what right. that is. Or... There, was, there was a diagram in this presentation which showed a sort of a bowl um, which the beans were dropped into. Um, a variety of shape of vessel sizes and shapes were used, uh, cylindrical ones, bowls, um, pyramidal things. I just um, mean even that this was simulated digitally and I think no, no one's aware of that. Yeah, we did, uh, we used um, uh, 3DS Max to uh, simulate um, dropping these into a bowl. <laughs> um, but yeah, as I've said, that sort of um, uh, did not provide the information uh, that we needed um, in, in its entirety, later discovered. <laughs> yeah, Nick, maybe like, sorry, go ahead. No, no. Anybody? Uh, like an analog is like the wind tunnel test where you use like an architectural model to simulate the effects of um, if it can withstand the, the effects of, of wind loads, um, in which like a, a purely digital um, simulation can't satisfy the same results or the same fidelity of results that a physical test can. And so, I, you know, there's like an interesting overlap there too um, in this process that you all have been um, investigating that I, I, I find productive as well. Like it's, it can't be entirely simulated. It can't be entirely physical. Like there's a kind of messy uh, feedback. And I think one more thing on that note, um, at least with the um, sort of initial predetermined uh, physics simulations of those assemblies, um, we, we acted on presumptions that Oh, if we, you know, put this rather large bean precariously hanging off of the side of this assembly, oh yeah, of course the connection will hold. Of course it's not going to rip out. Um, and perhaps that was a little bit too much uh, um, trust put in the system, um, but um, a, a lesson I think worth worth learning. <laughs> yeah, and I think um, I think the uh, process that um, Jorge was describing where we, after the initial failure of the um, assembly, where we went back and like did those diagrams of like um, different type, you know, labeling different types of assemblies, really understanding, using the scale models to really understand like what naturally holds up, what doesn't, um, calling them, I forgot what we called them, but like there's, you know, a stack version of blah, blah, blah. Um, I think those were like a really crucial step um, just from like the basic just physics simulations we did um, that were a little less uh, that we had less um, understanding of to fully making ourselves understand what was physically going on, what fit and structurally going on within the assemblies. After making the beans, did y'all find like any particular bean type to be more like efficient in stacking them? Or did you find yourself being like, oh, I wish I made more cradle beams or beans or, yeah. Um, I can answer that. Um, and I can also talk a little about the last question. Um, so basically uh, when um, the assembly team was working on the 3DS Max simulations, uh, you could say that to a point uh, you were uh, calculating for gravity and maybe shear uh, forces to an extent because you had this vessel and then you had the beans drop in. But once you remove the vessel, the, the beans would just like fall down. Uh, so when going to the actual scale models and um, playing with those, um, we noticed that uh, the hardest beans to work with uh, to make uh, a stable assembly were the spherical ones or like the most spherical ones. 
uh, which I believe are two. Uh, one that looks sort of like an egg and the other one's more of like a ball, sort of. Uh, and then the rest of the beans were sort of easy to work with because they had um, like weird cradles and um, spots and uh, different beans. So when you were trying to assemble those, uh, some beans uh, just made sense that uh, went with other beans because of the, um, the physical properties of those. And um, I also remember that um, when we built the stacking assembly on site, we were surprised because the thing held in place while the, uh, it was windy outside. And uh, it just showed us that um, equilibrium uh, plays a major role uh, in these. And then um, when we were disassembling the tripod assembly on site, um, uh, it was clear to us that uh, because of the connection types, uh, the assemblies held in place because uh, once we were, uh, we were uh, disassembling the tripod connection, uh, we cut a zip tie and we did not hold the bean while cutting the zip ties. And then as soon as we cut the zip tie, the, the whole bean just came down and ripped out uh, the anchors out. So we were like, oh, okay. So basically it was in place, not because of uh, anchoring the bean in a certain position. It was mainly because of the um, connection points. So it was like uh, going back and forth in between um, cradling, equilibrium, and then tension. And then uh, the type of uh, connections that you needed for that specific tension in specific places. Is so is is there a middle ground then? Kind of coming off that same question, where maybe you standardize a little bit and you have a little like flat surfaces, and you don't have necessarily a single point to point connection, but you would have a surface to surface um, by just kind of sanding down where they where they would be predicted to connect or by doing so and creating some set of standards is that then undermining the whole kind of point of the studio of having no standards or even maybe just to shift the question um slightly would that even help right? like would yeah. sanding down would, would like yeah. you were given the you know, uh, you know, flexibility, the option of sanding down um, and editing the beans after they're made, would that even have helped you? I think that in this specific process, um, working with the foam beans, it probably would be helpful to do something like that. But as representational materials, if you're working in still like the representational sphere, I don't think it would be beneficial because if you're working with something like boulders or construction debris, that's not something that's as easily um, sanded down or just adjusted in general. So trying to think about uh, connections with materials as found and doing that through foam was probably the best. This, yeah, I don't know if I have like a specific answer to the question, but it reminded me of, um, we did, we looked at another um, example um, project that was basically taking, I think, found um, concrete debris, um, it was either that or stones, and making it and compiling it into a wall. And a big part of their process was like this really complicated, um, like um, using robots, I think, and, um, to, and like water just to just sand down like the edges of the concrete to like specific predetermined kind of shapes. Um, and it was like really a lot of post-processing just by robots and um, other machines. Um, and I that made me like question when Adam presented that article to us, like, is that even really, like, is it kind of defeating the purpose when you, um, like, what's the, yeah, where does it become like useful? Um, when What is the line between standard and non-standard and like post-process, like how much post-processing is like, changes um, what you're actually doing with those. Yeah, like how much percentage of material can you remove before it turns into a standard material? Like if exactly, it's, yeah. If it's more of a giant log with like a square post on each end, is that just well, like- On that note though, I think we have to like kind of step back and ask like, well, what's the value of the non-standard like pursuit? 
and the, or the chase of it, which is like to use like it widens our options of material selection. So like maybe it, it doesn't matter if the like kind of margin of standardization becomes a little wider, if it widens or significantly widens the um, opportunity to use con uh, like concrete debris. I think that's awesome, right? Or to like, just like go to a um, demo site and just like hoard all of the, the, the rubble, um, if, if that becomes kind of potentially productive uh, building material, then I think that we should maybe be a little more um, open to whatever those, how I like how Sean put it, post-processing uh, techniques. And that could become a whole area of production. That could become a whole industry, right? Post-production rubble, right? You're the rubble team. I'm the metal team. I'm, you're the wood team. And there's just like industries that have become established that um, post-process these uh, kind of found conditions. I think that's awesome. Yeah, especially here in New Orleans where like recycling practices are just so bad. It's Very like true. New, new strains of where we can like distribute. Like I can't, I have to throw away my pizza box because there's grease in it. Um, like it's like kind of the, even the, the micro scale of like cardboards and plastics and glass. Um, and like independent people are now starting their own like glass recycling companies. They're converting glass bottles into sandbags for water water retention. So it's like, is this there's there's definitely possibilities of like that being part of the construction industry as well. Definitely. I mean, there's already like in, uh, pretty massive infrastructures of sorting and collecting. Um, our trash. And I wonder if like a new stream of that is to um, re reprocess it and turn it into, it's our, we already, uh, you know, turn a, a bunch of this stuff into our everyday uh, uh, goods, but it hasn't really come into um, the construction industry quite yet in terms of like, we're really into raw materials but maybe we should like really consider process materials um, that have been second, third, fourth life and so forth. If I can put that into context too, um, personal tidbit that happened um, while uh, in the studio um, in, in um, I, I'm not asking for pity here for the record, but uh, I'm from Lake Charles, Louisiana and Hurricane Laura um, devastated the town. I mean, truly. Um, and going back there and seeing physically like the sheer amount of debris um, that was, you know, it's, it's all going to be put into a landfill. Um, and all of those materials were at one point very standardized. They were in, you know, relatively, um, mundane constructions, you know, and uh, to think that all of that um, would be thrown away and not be used um, and would not contribute again, you know, in, in a seemingly okay form, you know, um, I, I brought the, the core of the studio full circle for me at least um, and the possibilities of it. I think that also plays off of kind of the act of repurposing and how you don't just repurpose it from one project and then it's newly repurposed to another project. It kind of carries that significance of what it was used before, which I think raw standardized building materials are so kind of anonymous. And yet that kind of the act of repurposing would add a sense of identity that we kind of lose when we just use new standard building materials. Um, I if I can, if I can jump in, I think that the the idea of new building materials is fascinating, like to me in particular. Um, I've recently been like thinking a lot about how um, like we we pretend to understand so many things as intrinsic to construction and the way that humans occupy space, whereas like 
structures have only been around for a few thousand years. Um, and humans like came around 200,000 years ago or so, and we've been building things for like 14,000 of those. Um, so like where the direction of construction is going, I think is really at the, the like a core part of this. Another part of the, um, I think the conversation that hasn't quite been brought up yet is um, that that reminds me of is like, is in some ways we're going to the past, but in a futuristic way, I guess, of like, um, of a lot of these type of systems of construction were in sort of used and before um, like the industrial revolution um, of like just taking found stone and um, doing small amounts of carving to make it fit together into walls and had like entire masonry um, uh, groups dedicated to do that. Um, and then in some ways we're doing a similar thing, but in other ways completely new of adapting that, but with the advantages of technology and um, and all this other stuff we know um, to make it um, applicable um, to the current world. Oh, Sean, I think that's a really um, great uh, point of discussion to also think about, you know, the historic method of the um, master builder or the incredible degree, the credible craft that um, uh, was labored into projects by hand. And then the kind of digital turn of the, the kind of anonymity of, of, of personal or idiosyncratic craft. Um, and then in this case, that's where that sort of returns to my question of like how to what degree was there um, like kind of physical or human agency in the um, assembly of these into the hill versus how much was it kind of predicted behavior from the um, computer and the fact that it was neither um, uh, could fit into one category. I think is exciting because it's starting to now like bridge between the kind of digital project and the kind of, uh, you know, carpenter craftsman um, of the past. Yeah, I think um, one of the big takeaways from the studio for me um, was uh, as someone who like didn't have a ton of experience with digital fabrication was that um, the the translation between digital and physical is only uh, only appears to be like seamless in a lot of cases because of standardization and that when you actually introduce um, like non standard materials and like with the 3D scanning um, the the like non precision of it uh, was kind of surprising to me. Um, we have about, I want to leave time for a break for the last, uh, for the second half. Um, so we have 15 minutes. So we have about uh, 20 minutes left. Um, and we'll break at, oh wait, this is, yeah, this, right. So the next half starts at 11 and it's uh, 10, 25 about. Um, so I, I really, I enjoy the meandering discussion. I think the meandering discussion is appropriate to, <laughs> a project that meandered and kind of sussing out some of these themes. And um, I'm, I'm curious to hear a little more from uh, the, um, a little more conversation about uh, these questions of let's say blurred territory, I, where it, it, I think that's a theme that happened throughout, right? It happened how the kind of, in, in the description the digital description, like let, there, things are lost in translation. Um, and uh, you worked in so many mediums at once, you know, like from uh, Rhino freeform to 3ds Max to paint and gesso. Um, and that sort of, there's all these, it was kind of this like exquisite corpse game, right? Of uh, you 
talking over Zoom or in communicating drawings, and each time there's like something lost. And I, I even think it's interesting how this conversation of like um, the when what forms do the beans take and what are their taxonomies remains uh, uncertain. Like there's a lot you're just not you. I think the studio and, and myself included just does not understand, which might even extend to the definition of non-standard. I think uh, Sean's critique of the Brandon Clifford project, um, you know, is an open question. Like how, at what point is endless kind of like, you know, um, uh, post-processing of, let's say, of found objects, at what point does that just become recreating standardization with, you know, um, and, and I think these remain very open questions and that's where I'm excited. And I think the studio, you, you've done an excellent job of kind of stabbing at these questions, sometimes blindly um, and sometimes not even knowing the, the broader picture, you know, um, that, which is one more thing I'd add. And then I, I wanna kind of have a few questions to kick off some conversation, but um, I should add too that the, uh, I didn't mention this in the beginning, but we launched into this exercise um, without the usual kind of, uh, <laughs> let's say, uh, sort of theoretical foundations or even like background. I just gave two papers the first day and presented some work and then we, the studio launched into this construction exercise. And then the reason for that was there's so much uncertainty if the school might shut down and the pandemic and this and that, um, and whether or not we'd even be able to work effectively um, to physically make things, whether that would even work, uh, my assessment is important to kick that off right away so we can evaluate that and abort it if needed or um, weave it together. And basically, it, I think it worked pretty well on a stretched out much longer. Um, so a lot of these questions I, you as, as students discovered um, and stumbled upon without even really recognizing that they were broader questions, like the question of the fixture, for example, um, uh, or the kind of how to make the fixture, like uh, Zach, who hasn't said much, you know, like at one point, I think I think it was you who came to me and, and had this kind of dawning realization that like uh, some other projects used exactly that same system, like with some random, I don't know what it was. Do you remember that, Zach? Yeah, it was actually the Bartlett Studio. It was for like a slightly different purpose, but um, the same kind of principles uh, held still. Um, and I think that goes, that sort of ties back to some of the other comments, but I'm, I'm curious to hear a little more from, from all of you in the studio and kind of, and critics as you, um, where you see these moments of, let's say just not indefinitiveness, what's the word there? Um, you know, these blurry moments of where there, is, there aren't answers to how, to what extent are heuristics versus digital prescription, you know, the right method. And I think there's open questions even from the very beginning. And if like once the beans are modeled, I mean, how good are your models? There's just, there wasn't a way of knowing. I think that that, that fuzzy territory where um, your understandings are defined as an overlap is really exciting. Um, and I think at the beginning of the studio, again, it was like, that was, was I, I think many of you in the studio saw that as a, just a source of like an obstacle to be brushed aside, you know, smacked out of the way, imprecision, intolerance. Um, and then you'd smack at it and it would pop back up, right? You know, um, and it is kind of a, a whack-a-mole. You smack it away and then it pops up somewhere else. And that was kind of, that was this game we were playing, right? To where you're, uh, you know, um, you know, the areas you worked on individually, right? You would, um, you know, outsource your precision to someone else. Um, like, yeah. So I, I, there's, I don't, I don't quite. I think that, but that discussion of kind of where the whack-a-mole of tolerance and precision, um, whether it's between groups, I think these were really fascinating moments. And maybe with reflection, I hope that it's it's clear to some of you that the um, you know, the, these aren't bugs that can just be eliminated, but rather kind of a fundamental constraint that gets redistributed, whether it's across teams or into digital and into models. I'm curious just to hear maybe having said all that, you know, um, perhaps from some of you in the studio or your observations as critics, um, 
uh, let's say where um, where you see understanding is kind of a limit. Uh, understanding or clarity is sort of a, a fundamental limit versus um, one that would have been ironed out with time. Um, I know it's a heady question, but um, you know where where was understanding um, or kind of the limits of clarity something that is really fundamental and should have changed the way of working, or where is um, you know, and understanding means limits of tolerance, limits of precision, um, understanding structure, um, you know, exchange of information, description. Um, but where where is understanding just a kind of uh, a, a local failure of of your work or of, or of the project, or something that's really a fundamental issue? Um, well, one thought I had when you were. Um like kind of going through the initial, like from Rhino to CNC milling was how like the sort of inaccuracies you get as you get to like the end pieces, you know, it starts, the edges start to get a bit frayed, you need to start filling in the form. And I was kind of wondering like how, how much like um, replicability, I guess, do we want in the physical space? Like if we're, like the machine is kind of not giving you what you want it to give you. So how much do you keep pushing for it to sort of be the ideal rhino form? You know, like if, because it kind of seems to be like, it's trying to be standard to its non-standard self. Like it's not <laughs> sort of working with the, like the imprecision that you're putting it through, you know? I don't know how necessary that is maybe. Like, like thinking when you, um start to do like the cnc routing like um like if you were to do the entire bean on like the three axis router like the the one that does it like fully as an object um like it starts first taking away like the material and you're sort of left with the general outline of the form like as the stepping before you get to the refinement and i'm wondering if there's like a um like how refined does it need to be could there sort of be a benefit to to leaving it unrefined and then that somehow allows for connections and new opportunities with the form or does it need to try and be a hundred percent what it is in Rhino? I think that the answer to that question kind of falls from the, the brief that we were given and this, this project specifically um, required that they have a high fidelity to what was modeled, um, seeing as the uh, the assemblies and like the the hills were being generated at the same time that these things were being machined, which is to say that there's limited ability to know what would have come off the table or off of the the router table before it had actually been cut. Um, so, upon handing off the somewhat low resolution versions of the Rhino model to be sanded and sculpted and then transformed to more accurately reflect it um, was integral to this project in particular. Um, but using the CNC router as a means of creating other ab abstractions of non-standard materials, that's a, that's a, I, I am intrigued by that direction. But like Jesse, if, you know, I've there were like the constraints of the project, um, which were pushing uh, this sort of extreme, like idealized condition, as you said. But you know, uh, upon maybe having gone through this experience, um, and I and I, I should, you know, for context, just that the idea of uh, let's say fabricating the beans out of foam extends to the project that Sean cited, in which the post processing is current to stone. But like, how much precision? Um, is uh, how much should precision be a, a goal and how much does precision kind of hold you back? And I would say like, you know, like when you tried to scan the beans, it didn't work because they were too precise. And if they had been scanned with a rough cut or like the texture would be on them, um, you know, what do you, wh wh where would you draw the line of like, where should precision occur? You know, what, I, what do, you, do you have thoughts on that? I don't know. I think that there, um, I, I would argue that there is no line 
that it it really it varies and that line would shift and move depending on what the the desired or intended result of the project would be um because like as you had said like um this one we were trying to push this unattainable high resolution perfection of the rhino model but um there's there's a lot of room to to explore um, having the artifacts of machining I um i think like this question um it's gonna be very hard to articulate but I think it makes me think about um, how even this whole conversation is like within some um, like assumptions and values and standards um, for the buzzword uh, on like the value of on the need and value for things like precision and efficiency. Like if we're talking about like, um, uh, the, you know, which, whether standard or non-standard systems are more efficient for different reasons. Um, but I think, you know, it's, there's like this world of established like construction and architecture field um, values on things being pre-planned and exact and precise um, that, um, that this question of um, whether the CNC foam, you know, sh should be planned to come out precise. Um, it assumes that, um, it assumes that assumption that like precise is, or questions that assumption that precise is always better and everything should be pre-planned versus um, maybe more traditional where things were a little bit intended to be more loose. Uh, that was very rambling, but. <laughs> Um, no, I think that was really good, Sean. I, I think that's really good. I, I, I think what it, if it, I think what you're saying, my understanding of what you're saying is that precision is um, a a sort of un, it's conceived, it's framed as a universal good amid standardization, a kind of and a maybe not true achievable goal, but something you're always pushing to the fullest extent and kind of unquestioned. And in the world of standards, that makes sense. And then outside. Uh, uh, when you're making, say, your own standards or working with things outside of standards, uh, precision is something to weigh as a trade-off for the, the resources you put or, you know, the effort you put into standardization could go elsewhere. Um, and, uh, and it's just one more kind of like attribute of a project to be, uh, let's say, the value which can be measured. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I... I think to like to give a concrete example of this, like where, like going back to what Adam said about, um, like where does the precision happen, and like, is what is the value of precision? Like, um, the w the like magnet connections versus the uh, zip tie connections was like an example of like the zip ties would be more forgiving towards um, like having less precision earlier in the process. So I think one of the things we learned was like about sometimes it's more efficient to to not worry as much about precision at a certain part of the process and then um, have some kind of system that's like more forgiving towards having less precision. Yeah, adding on to that, um, I would say that um, if, you, if we were to have access to like a multi-axial CNC machine, uh, no doubt the machine would like um, mock up an assembly super fast with precision like at 99.9%. And uh, we would even try to use like uh, one point connections and just like dowels or stuff like that. And maybe uh, it, it, it would work. <clears throat> but then um, when we were uh, assembling these, uh, if you were to push on the assembly because of the connection types that we used uh, being zip ties, uh, the structure of the actual assembly wasn't rigid and it, was, and it would allow us to move the, the beans without the assembly tipping or moving in any uh, sort of way. Well, if I'm wondering if uh, the assembly was done um, all digitally with uh, single point connections, then what would happen when you bring this uh, like super precise, perfect uh, thing into an imperfect world and then you nest it in the world? 
and you push it. And even though this whole structure is uh, super precise and perfect, uh, because of the single point connections, then it would make it um, more easily to be tipped by someone that like goes and touches the structure and stuff like that. So that's that's one thing that ha has had me thinking about uh, where is the um, the spectrum of like precision and being imprecise and what's the middle ground if there is any middle ground. Uh, for example, um, I was part of the urban build last semester and then I learned uh, <laughs> that buildings are very imprecise. And then you work towards making, uh, like basically masking those imprecisions to make it look perfect, but they're not really perfect. So uh, in this studio, that was one thing that played a major role in like uh, us figuring out what should be precise and what shouldn't, and what's the easiest um, thing to work with being a uh, human, I'd say, so yeah. Oh, I think those are really good comments. Um, it pains me to transition and, and into the second half um, uh, because I just think this discussion is great. Uh, I would I would love to see this presented side by side with uh, some of the work on urban build. You know, like and not not the final project, but like you know, uh, and it's true. There's whole trades that exist uh, just to hide imprecision. You know, crown molding and or whatever else. You know, um, uh, um, you know. And, and whole kind of uh, <clears throat> um, areas of expertise, trades, and so on. A couple quick themes, and um, I want to offer the critics um, and everyone a, a quick break here. Um, and but a, a couple themes I'd call out, um, and I think emerged well in this conversation is one is just the limits of computation. Uh, I think Jorge, you cited, you know, what if we had these five-axis robots and so forth, um, but there, that's another ideal. Like I feel like the precision is this ideal um, that is difficult to actually realize, or it's complicated the closer you get to it. And uh, technology is much the same way. We kind of accept that, um, you know, in the same way that maybe in the 1960s everyone thought, well, we by now we'd all have personal spaceships and fly to the moon. Like there's this natural trajectory where technology just gets more and more powerful and solves more and more of our problems. Um, and it's not really the case. Uh, there are some of these problems that we butt up against that are really hard. 3D nesting just pretty much doesn't exist. Um, 2D nesting it slows down even the fastest computer. Um, and 3D nesting just really doesn't exist in a meaningful way. There's a lot of current research on that. I'm sure that one can get solved by faster and faster computers. Um, but it's an it's a extraordinarily complicated question. And similarly, um, we take for granted that there's just sort of, um, let's say, Simul digital simulation, you know, well, we can, now, now we can do the rudimentary physics, but soon enough there'll be robust physics, but the complexity of materials, they have an intelligence that is just cannot be digitized. Um, there's, and there will always be um, a huge amount, the texture, the, the you know, um, the, you know, the surface texture or uh, kind of the structural properties of a bean and even just kind of mass distribution and the weight of paint, that would be pointless, you know, what is it? Uh, rolling the bean up the hill, the Greek uh, person who rolls the bean up the hill. Um, and uh, and similarly, I mean, that transitions the notion of what, uh, you know, that, that where, how far does computation take? I think that's, it's, a, it's coming and that it's going to transform. It's already, I mentioned, you know, uh, uh, logs before they become dimensional lumber or a CAT scan or, you know, whatever else. Um, the technology is coming, it's infusing um, but it's not going to be this kind of clear makes everything. It's not going to bring clarity. It's going to bring a more complicated landscape, which transitions into another question is like, it's territory to be fought over. And where will expertise lie? Will it occur in the kind of industrialized, as it does now, industrialized uh, processing of materials into standard goods? Or is it what opportunities exist on site um, or farther in the uh, life cycle <clears throat> for craft or what was maybe once known as craft, um, you know, for designers and architects, um, rather than just inheriting the results of all this technology to actually engage it, appropriate it and adopt it, you know, um, is it a, is it a sort of fantasy, um, you know, in a good way or bad way to, what if raw materials are dropped off on site, there's a robot and some scanning and they're processed unique to that site with the help of software. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, is it possible? And lastly, I think the, the most important question um, 
uh, is, uh, you know, how we understand materials themselves and where, how we value them. And I think in Jorge, your comment is really good because, uh, you know, we hide these things. Um, we hide the two, you know, the standardization design. You look at a wall and, you know, yeah, maybe you accept that it's drywall, but you certainly don't think what's, what's in drywall. Where did it come from? Where did any of this come from? Uh, and the same way I like to cite the examples of in the 1950s, no one would care where their stake came from. It's just it wrapped in plastic and a stake is a stake. It becomes a commodity. A wall is a blank surface. Um, whereas now you like to go to the artisanal butcher with the, the 26 year old with the handlebar mustache or whatever, you know, and um, or the curly Q mustache. But, um, and uh, and buy a steak that had a name. The cow had a name, was raised over here, and kind of had some. You know, you get a cheat, a cheat sheet on the personality or whatever. Um, and I think there's an opportunity here to not only think on the the back end of the material life cycle and how we say post process waste, but even and again, you cited this myth. A lot of that rubble from the hurricane, it's useless because it's just junk materials. Um, but a, a kind of a re a, there's an opportunity along the way. Um, to rethink uh, the val how we value materials, how we value a materials life cycle, and where the processing occurs. Right now, it's all at the front end. Um, it doesn't just have to be on the back end. It can be an ongoing expectation that the material will be processed. Um, and, and I think that reframing is the most valuable thing that can come out of this, these lines of inquiry. Um, I want to offer the critics, uh, I want to thank the students, um, of course, for presenting. Um, and uh, I want to thank all of the critics um, for coming. I wish we had more time. Offer a, uh, if you have quick thoughts, uh, I would welcome them. I know uh, some of you have to go. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, and some of you sticking around, I actually kind of I forget. Uh, let's see. Maria, you, you're leaving us, correct? Um, and Bruce, you're leaving us as well. If, if you have closing thoughts, and if any, but if anyone else needs to take a break, if any of the other critics I want to, um, uh, who are sticking around to the afternoon, I want to offer you the opportunity to take a break now. But I'd love to hear any closing thoughts from uh, Maria or, or Bruce. Um, hmm. I think just like yeah, thank you. <laughs> congratulations in general for like completing it. Like I know how hard it is to like go, especially like working in the 3D print lab, like seeing everyone's like ideal Rhino model and then like dealing with the sort of imperfections that happen later and that sort of translation between digital and analog. So like, I think that y'all learned a lot through that process and there's probably a lot more that you can take, not just from the studio and beans, but like into your future projects that like will definitely help your understanding of tolerance um, and everything. I wanna slide in here too um, and apologize that something unforeseen has come up. So I actually can't stay for the afternoon session. So I wanna offer my congratulations as well. And um, also say that, you know, we put our faith in you as the next generation, right? And so um, to some of the points made, this is really next generation um, technology, next generation problems. And um, as Adam mentioned, these uh, issues are already starting to kind of percolate the industry, the AEC industry, with the logs being kind of CAT scanned before they get further processed. So um, I think it's wonderful and exciting to see you all grapple with these um, uh, technologies, these challenges, these kind of conceptual and philosophical questions. I think it's been um, such a terrific uh, discussion and I wish we had another you know, maybe half hour to really kind of hash some of these things out. Um, but I know uh, these are lasting questions. So um, they are definitely kind of new beginnings and points of departure for further, uh, further architectural um, positing. So anyway, uh, again, congratulations. You have my deepest respect. It was a pleasure. Um, spending the morning with you all and a privilege to, to be a part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, uh, and uh, I, I will, I will um, stop my video and mute so you can all take a break. Um, we'll reconvene at, uh, um, oh, uh,
Bruce, am I cutting off a, a comment from you? I, uh, you know, it, I've, I've found this really uh, uh, challenging, I guess it's challenging for a, a, a critic in the kind of traditional mode as it probably was for all of the students because there are so many uh, blurred boundaries. And I'm, I, I mean, I have written down like 10 different subjects here, but I don't have a, uh, I, I've, I've been trying to think of something intelligent to, to say that will actually add to knowledge here, but I, I, I mostly just have a whole lot of questions. And I, I guess I'm realizing that what you guys are doing is the equivalent to uh, basic research in science. That is, you don't really know what it's going to yield eventually. It's, uh, it's just, you're trying to discover knowledge, but you know, there's no uh, kind of standard architectural brief. You're not trying to create space for human habitation or something. So uh, the, all of the, the, any context that I would have for my standard spiel is, is gone. Um, but the, uh, a couple of the subjects that seem to be most fascinating are uh, have to do with additive versus subtractive manufacturing and uh, and construction that is assembled uh, versus that that's monolithic uh, and and so trying to think about the future of construction and how we might use recycled materials or construction debris or you know broken bits of concrete and stuff uh, it, it it seems like the, you know all of those subjects are interwoven uh, but I I mean it seems like this is really an exploration rather than a, a conclusion so, I'm, I'm just kind of, uh, I admire uh, the fact that, uh, you know, that you set this up this way and that everybody kind of engaged it that way. Uh, so it's really uh, thought provoking, but unfortunately I don't have anything um, that really sheds light on it. Uh, that hasn't already been said. I mean, right off the bat, Carrie said something about you know the limits of uh, uh, architectural description and Jeff Koons and things that had occurred to me too. But she stole them, so I can't, I can't <laughs> say anything. I can't yeah, I'm say familiar anything with that. witty or or or, uh, or clever about it. Um, uh, so anyway, it's it's certainly made me it's gotten me thinking though. I think that's it's a I couldn't ask for a better uh, final comment, Bruce, because I think that this is actually one um, a key struggle in this studio that I, I didn't anticipate was the transition uh, of thinking among the students from um, targeting specific answers and um, and providing a definitive conclusion versus expanding the territory and kind of opening up territory and asking increasingly better questions and seeing that as a goal. I mean, that, that, that exactly what you just did, you know, is um, my highest hopes for the studio. And I think, as you pointed out uh, in the comparisons of science, I think is really the goal of the research studio. It's not just a personal agenda, but it's, it's an agenda for the studio. And, and lastly, I I'd happily have a, an hour session on this too, that subtractive versus additive manufacturing is absolutely a subsect because I think the scale, you know, when beans get smaller, they become, uh, you know, gravel and, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so forth. Let's, um, uh, let's take a break. What I, what we can do is um, let's take a break for the, uh, until um, 105, um, a little bit truncated here. 
Um, and, uh, or let's say 107, we'll be 107, I'll give us exactly 10 minutes. And uh, the, the critics joining us, I will get, offer them a little background. If everyone can please come back at uh, 107. You mean 1107? Uh, excuse me, 1107, don't come back after the end of the review. Yes, 1107, take 10 minutes break. Uh, I will kind of onboard the uh, uh, critics coming in at that time. Um, and uh, Bruce, if you if you want to stick around uh, at all and see some of the next phase, otherwise, uh, uh, you know. Yeah, I will actually. I, I, I do. I am curious, and and I'll I'll just hang in the background and listen. <laughs> so. Okay. And also quickly for the students, um, uh, the um, presentation order um, and timing. Wait for it. Um, Lauren, if you could please go first and take 30 minutes. Um, Nick, if you could go afterwards and take 30 minutes. Um, and uh, Hayden, Melina, and Zach, if you can uh, go uh, last and take 40 minutes. That will give us a little bit of a buffer time. Um, I will, uh, if you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you all back here at, um, at 107. Maria, you're, you're, you're leaving us as well, correct? Um, yes. Well, if you're free later, um, I'll send you, we can text, but um, thank you so much. Yeah, it was really fun. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank that was you. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, Andrew. Andrew? Hello. How are you doing? Thanks for joining. We, we actually just wrapped up. Um, I couldn't resist. Just, everyone had good comments, so things ran out a little long. And so we're going to start at 107. Um, and I can, but I can use this time to uh, do the usual onboarding and introduction uh, to the studio. Um, Perfect. I watched the last uh, half hour. Uh, I just had oh, it great. on in the background while I was doing a little work. Um, well, the, yeah, the first half, um, so there's an extra, the, the, have you had a chance to look at the brief much or? Yeah, I've read it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, the first half, and this was actually intended to be a, um, uh, the second part was intended to be more substantial, but the first half took much longer pandemic hurricanes, you name it. Uh, so we're looking at about a third, uh, of the semester. Um, is the second half, which are these like capstone projects, I'm calling them. And uh, the first half was an exercise to kind of tease out the complexity of these kind of discussions to inform uh, these individual or in some cases group uh, research projects. So uh, the brief, did you see the brief for the, I, I think I sent it for the... Um, yeah, the four, it's four parts where you, um, you sort of document construction waste and then you document um, material connections. Um, and then the third part, that's at least what you sent me, uh, the PDF. Yeah. So um, even that is a, little, um, is a little complicated because, let's see here. Um, uh, um, I'm trying to pull this up because there, there were like, uh, in that process, um, let's see. we hurricanes hit and shut down some of that timeline. So right. uh, losing all my all my zooms and everything all over the screen. Um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So the idea was to kind of build off of this. Um, they were tasked with um, this first part. We're going to skip. They, they, this was too comp compromised by hurricanes, um, perhaps ironically. <laughs> uh, but these reports, uh, you know, it was a bit much. And all, similarly, the survey of techniques, I think, was probably the, um, at the heart of this exercise. And they were assigned to these categories, uh, stone to metal, stone to wood, stone to stone, um, with stone as the, as the kind of um, natural version of the bean. Um, Oh, I think we have uh, Inyaki joining us now as well. Inyaki. Oh, now he's gone. Welcome. Oh, there Inyaki. 
Ben Yagi, thank you so much for joining. We're so happy to have you here. So the last, um, uh, the first half uh, of the review was dedicated to, first half of the semester and the first half of the review were dedicated to building uh, a hill of beans and the, which was an exercise. Let's see, I'll, I'll, I'll pull up some of the photos on concept board. Um, the, uh, which is a, a studio-wide exercise You've probably seen the beans around. Um, share screen. I'm not sure if you're seeing the uh, some of the work, this hill of beans on the screen. Yes. Uh, great, yeah. So this was an exercise in um, uh, kind of exploring thresholds of standardization uh, and non-standard. And oh, great, we have Ben coming too. Um, and Ben has seen some of this as well. Uh, but this exercise, they had to develop and build the beans and then figure out how to locate uh, uh, points on the beans digitally and kind of go back and forth between digital and analog heuristic methods uh, and kind of digitally prescriptive methods and broke into groups and so forth. And so this conversation informed the second half, um, which... Um, in which they transitioned uh, to these individual and group projects. Hi, Ben, welcome. Um, I was just giving a recap of where we're at. We started, we ran a little late, so we're gonna start at 11.07 uh, with all the students and um, uh, uh, on this lesson two. So this, this portion took about a third of the semester. Um, they've had since, let's see, uh, um, it was disrupted by hurricanes. But I guess basically the beginning of November. Um, so they've, they've, they've had about a month on this. And the, uh, the task for them, this was building off the, the hill of beans. The task given to the students was um, to uh, use stone um, as a found stone, or uh, in some cases rubble, as the non-standard material. Um, unfinished stone, as found stone. And so it's broken up into four parts. And the first part was compromised by hurricanes and shutdowns and so forth. So we probably won't look at this portion, um, this report on construction waste, but this was a, a deep dive background um, into where waste occurs in the entire life cycle of building materials, not just stone, um, from extraction and manufacturing uh, to you know, infrastructure and road work waste to um, in other forms of embodied energy and so on, which was, uh, uh, um, again, we won't see that, but uh, some of the underlying you know, questions uh, in the studio uh, uh, tie back to, those, to the waste and material life cycle and thinking about kind of um, how to use not just the back end, but the front end. And then a survey of techniques, which is probably the biggest chunk of time. Um, students were assigned specific connection materials. So stone, stone to metal, um, stone to wood, uh, stone to stone joined, which meant uh, um, like uh, um, edited stone, um, carved stone, manipulated stone, structured stone or stone to stone unjoined. And examples include um, say corbeling for stone to stone unjoined or, or kind of various joint types in stone to stone. And the survey of techniques, the, in the survey of techniques, the students were asked to look at, um, let's say traditional and historic pre-digital practices um, and even especially pre-industrial practices. Uh, practices in which the expertise, uh, workmanship and craft occurred um, on site uh, for the most part, or nearly on site, rather than industrialized and, and standardized and purchased at Home Depot, right? And building off of that, so they should they will be presenting a survey of techniques. Uh, building off of that was a um, physical prototyping in which the students um, were asked to uh, explore these techniques um, and through uh, or informed by the possibilities of digital fabrication. So we, they had access to a 3D, the school's 3D scanner um, and 
and were asked to speculate on, uh, on, um, you know, even kind of how that process might be informed by the robot. There was ambitions to bring to make the robot accessible. Um, it was a bit overreaching for this semester. And in some cases, these physical prototypes, probably even two cases, became um, uh, digital prototypes rather than physical prototypes because of the kind of back and forth between quarantine or students going remote, uh, which was which was kind of a theme throughout the semester. Um, so, and lastly, a set of speculative designs, which which kind of blurs with the um, the the prototypes in the sense that uh, these are not speculations into how these are going to solve an industry problems or even be applied directly, um, but uh, initial questioning of how the prototypes might scale up um, and so forth. So I think we will see it in, um, I think we will see all of this presented very well. And in, in I think we have, we have three presentations um, and the first will run, uh, the first two are individual work and it will run a half an hour each. Um, and the last is a group of three, which will run for 45 minutes. Um, and we have a little bit of tolerance built in there uh, to allow for transitions and opening questions, but I'd like to try and stay as much as possible on, on schedule. And um, Lauren McGrath will be kicking us off. Uh, please feel free to ask questions about the brief and, and Lauren McGrath. We can allot a little more time if the critics have questions. Um, now that we're all back, I want to introduce our critics again. Um, I've introduced uh, uh, Bruce and um, uh, uh, Riley. Um, is Riley back with us? And yeah, hi, Riley. So I'm scanning my Zoom uh, before, and I think that all the new critics know Riley um, and, uh, and of course, Bruce and of course, Nick, uh, but introduce Andrew Lyles, who I believe you all know. Um, but uh, I, I think Andrew Lyles uh, has a background. Um, and a practice that overlaps with um, uh, making at various scales and fabrication at various scales that I, th that I think will make this conversation, uh, will help inform this conversation. Um, and Ben Smith, who has been on reviews before, I'm not I'm gonna, sorry, Ben, I'm not gonna give you an introduction. introduction. Um, and uh, Dean Alde, um, who we're very fortunate to have joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Anyaki. Um, again, I, needs no introduction. And if, if I did give an introduction, it would take up a, at least 15 minutes of our time. So with that, um, <laughs> uh, Lauren, can you please kick us off and maybe uh, feel free to give a little bit of background and explain um, uh, the, the parameters of the brief as you understood it and as you followed it as well. While you're playing that up, is there anything I, I, need, I didn't, I omitted um, or any questions from the critics? So we'll, we'll look for about a, a, a 10 minute plus or minus presentation and then 20 minutes of uh, conversation. Um, so I'm Lauren McGrath. Um, to give a summary from the brief as I understood it, it was an exploration of different types of stone to stone connections ranging from wood, metal, um, unjoined and joined stone to stone connections. It was an exploration of how these um, methods of co material combinations have changed over time. Um, what are the implications of discussing these types of connections within modern technology? How can we explore the connections in our own prototypes? Um, and what we take away from those prototypes at the end. So, um, my topic was stone to stone connections, specifically joined stone to stone connections. So the history of stone cutting is incredibly rich due to the complexity of stone cutting and joining. Stones were cut and joined by hand, was a labor intensive act and often required a well-developed system of tools and techniques. Even with limited means, a large amount of variation existed within these techniques resulting in a rich taxonomy of surrounding stone cutting and joining, um, as did a diverse range of methods of joining. Um, 
The range of joints across materials all serve different purposes um, and specifically designed for those purposes. For example, the plug joint um, kept side joints from coming loose and its design was consistent, consisted of a metal plug being poured into carved grooves on two sides of abutting uh, stones. A majority of joints draw upon four fundamental sets of conditions and the joints accompanying those conditions. These fundamental joints um, often combine within a joint called a cramp joint. Now what's a cramp joint? A cramp joint commonly defined in sources is a cramp uh, is a joining object with downturned ends. Upon further investigation, cramps are much more versatile in application and form as seen through more historical examples. Ancient masons used cramps to join large stones. Um, and they did this in place of mortar, often using the cramps to align the stones before or during construction with prominent users of cramps being the ancient Greeks, Egyptians, and Tiahuanacans. These um, civilizations used cramps, materials such as wood, bronze, iron, and even uh, the stones themselves carved into cramp shapes. Stonemasons would go on to use iron cramps poured and enclosed with lead. Um, this method was popularized by the Greeks, but even used past them due to its prevention against erosion. Cramps are able to interact at the different stages of construction and their uses vary depending on which stage of construction they enter. They can act as a temporary alignment or removed after stone placement settling or can be permanent um, joining pieces laid within the stone or within the assembly. Oftentimes, um, the cramps can even be semi-permanent, though usually not done purposefully. Cramps can erode over time. Specifically, a good example would be the ones made of wood um, or the ones that simply rusted, rusted away due to oxidization. This occurs when the cramp isn't fully enclosed and air is able to leak in. Um, though this leaves behind a cramp socket from the deteriorated cramp resulting in a surface quality of its own. Based on, um, based on this research of conditions, a cramp can be defined as a connecting piece, an overlapping, and an inset. Why specifically a cramp? Masons use cramps to join large stones, to bypass the use of mortar, and to keep stones alignment at any construction phase. The problem with cramps often was due to oxidation. The cramp would be exposed to air, rust, and compromise the integrity of the stone, resulting in cracking. From these conclusions draws the question, unrestrained by handheld tools, what new design possibilities do cramps have with the modern precision of digital fabrication? While the idea of precision is not new, especially in stone cutting, the introduction of modern technology allows for faster, easier, more consistent precision. Digital scanning, corrosion resistant metals, and electric saws and modern mechanical fasteners all are new tools available to join stones. The use of scanning and digital modeling can increase the control of precision, front loading the work into planning rather than the old um, trial and error method of cutting away at the stone and refitting the cramp and cutting away and refitting the cramp. Uh, but, uh, Lauren, can you explain, before you go on, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but explain what we're looking at here for those who may not be familiar. Of course, this is, um, exploration of specifically the bow tie cramp um, joining to rocks. The idea would be that as seen here, the cramp can come apart and be pre-planned and pre-installed and then connected rather than the stones being perfectly aligned from the beginning and the cramp being placed into the aligned stones is basically front loading the work onto the digital alignment rather than physical alignment. And uh, sorry, one more interruption, but you're, you're a remote student. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if everyone knew. And um, can you explain um, whose work this is and how it was done? Um, this is my work. 
Um, so these were rock models that I, that I considered non-standard materials considering I found them online and specifically selected them um, from the package of the digital rocks. I then designed the cramp within Rhino. I exported it into 3ds Max and rendered it out as um, an idealized form of a prototype that might be built had um, in-person uh, possibilities. I guess in-person work could have been done. Um, Thanks, I just wanted to make sure everyone understood this is a rendering that you made that. Oh, yes. Yes, this is a render. It looks it looks so good that it could be the illusion of being real. Thank How you. on earth did she cut that? <laughs> um, um, to continue though, electric um, solid big smoother surfaces and large precise cuts, most likely faster than the simple chisel and hand tools of the ancient stomations. Uh, precision then becomes also a play in aesthetics in addition to the aggregation of the stones. In this example, I um, explored how the smooth surfaces interact with each other, specifically how precise cuts in the stone can be um, combined with the cramps in um, rather than in simple one location incisions, across the entire stone. Um, this is a close-up example of the cramp going into the stone from that cut. Um, of this approach to precision by means of modern technology presents the opportunity to study and celebrate the cramp, not only as a means of joining, but also as a design opportunity. This example is an exploration of combining those two previous prototypes into what could be um, a system of aggregation with um, the form, uh, the complete form of the stone with um, sawn uh, stones and smoother surfaces and um, the aesthetic qualities that it could present. This is a close up of that intersection between the spatial condition and the precise cut into the stone and the layering of the cramp within to, into it. Um, and this is the overview of the three prototypes of I explored for cramps. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, fantastic work. I, uh, I'm sure this is, I think some of you, uh, uh, for those of the critics who have been on um, or been following the first half, um, perhaps this is a kind of the logic and continuity of clear. Um, and then for those just joining us, uh, again, the, the questions here are, uh, the question before us are kind of how, um, what craft can mean and what new possibilities uh, exist as Lawrence stated so eloquently, um, given digital tools. So there's a presumption of uh, here of um, 3D scanning um, to uh, make, to bring the models together with precision, um, to five axis milling with robots or five axis, say water jet cutting. Um, and the, I asked the students to um, not emphasize, uh, not try and build buildings out of these, but to explore what these objects might look like, uh, what these connections might look like and how they might work um, with unburdened by the uh, full constraints of, say, converting this into a building material. But I think that oh, there's an open question um, here that the students are exploring uh, about speculating on where, where this goes next as well. So I think all of that is fair territory um, to ask. But one of the themes, again, from the last, uh, picking up from the last half of the semester and the last half of the, the review is, is asking better and better questions and not rather than just looking at, here's a definitive answer. Traditional craft um, and working with sound materials means this now instead, um, um, you know, again, uh, cracking open uh, a set of questions. Um, Lauren, I think it looks 
Fantastic. Um, I think like these the three images you have here are great explorations. Um, and it's really helpful, I guess, for for me and like I guess Riley I mean, the, to have the context of the previous project to kind of back this up. But kind of looking at this on its own as like, say if I was looking at this in a bubble, I think you're missing like a couple of key steps about kind of like, even if even if it's digital and we're think, showing these things remotely, um, it'd be helpful to like show like an example of a project that's like cutting stone and like the type of tools that would use to like precisely digitally fabricate these cuts and like maybe a, a stab at like how, like what the jig would be to hold these rocks in place as you're cutting it. Um, and like, like, like just pretend that like these rocks have been scanned and I'm going through this process physically, but like, how do I replicate that and produce it? I mean, in terms of simulations about the ideas and the process behind, I think it's absolutely lovely. I mean, I would like to see like, like, a, a, like a section cutting through it instead of just like the 3ds max beautiful renderings um so that we can kind of get a sense of like the the technology behind it and how it would be feasible and possible yeah that would definitely been like um if i had more time like, i definitely would have loved to make more drawings of it specifically like non-rendering drawings yeah. of it. I would definitely help clarify exactly how certain things are coming together yeah like i think for the portfolio it would be awesome if you did like a similar image as like the one with the, the two people with the ladder with the hill of beans like you're like you're drawing the robot arm the jig the section through it so that like it's kind of like grounding the rendering so it's not just like i know how to render really well mm -hmm. question uh lauren uh, in the in the first prototype that you have this this bow tie uh, cut in two which is intuitively um, contradictory to the idea of the of the joint. How do you, why do you do that and and why and how you reconstitute the the connection? The um the cut going through the entire stone. Like, what was my reasoning for that? Well, uh, the the bow tie piece instead of being one piece that connects two mm -hmm. stones. It's uh, two pieces, uh, right? Which so um, the opposite to the to the intuitive uh, purpose of this. So why and, and how you reconstitute the 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 connection? So um, for my that was the first prototype, and I was exploring um, the idea of what it means to break the cramp and like since. The idea of like if cramp is always like a one piece and I want to explore what it might be if it was multiple pieces and instead of being installed after um, alignment installed like during alignment almost or else the alignment coming after you put them together and just the, the idea of um, being able to place the cramps in digital space and seeing them align in physical space afterwards. Um, so I think it was just more of an explanation of what it, the idea of what it would look like to break the cramp in two. I mean, it's almost like an expression of the cramp and the connection. I mean, it could very easily just be like two pieces welded together. Um, I think that the idea is that like you're you're aligning them separately, and maybe there's a possibility of like the bow tie not being like perfectly like bow tie. There's like opportunities for twisting, and like you can have it slide in from one axis in one and one axis the other, and it creates an even stronger connection. So you're not like relying on gravity of like the bow tie going straight down. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like you're, you're like multiple connections coming in. So it's like right now, like separating it isn't really doing something that's different than the traditional masonry or like bow ties that of the past, but with digital fabrication and six axis milling, it doesn't have to be so normative. Like it, it can get even like crazier and wilder with the, the connection and how these pieces interlock. Yeah, I was going to kind of piggyback on that. I love the idea like that these could like the right one in the first prototype could ro rotate 90 from the other one. And what does does that now allow a locking mechanism like when you put a soldier course in a brick wall, right? Or like um, 
now, like this one's vertical, this one's horizontal, the next ones on the opposite side can do the opposite. And they're locking together like traditional uh, solid brick walls, right? And so mm -hmm. th that's an example of, I think, what Dean Alday was getting at is, if it is two pieces, why don't you make that connection threaded or rotatable or uh, whatever the, the word is? The other thing I'm fascinated with is the hole. Um, yours is the first cramp that's hollow. Like, and I immediately thought, because I'm doing an ICF house in South Mississippi, insulated block. And, uh, you know, you have to use, this is like any block, you have to use that for rebar. Is that hole, why is it, why is it hollow? And is there any benefit? Uh, I'm, 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 I think I'm right. There were no hollow cramps in the historical precedents you set. So um, what's, is that tube allow you, that void allow you some benefits? Right, so initially um, it was hollow because I was considering how metal usually looks, um, to, at least to me. Um, I don't usually see solid pieces of metal in the shape of like that cramp, or I couldn't envision like, um, or I wasn't envisioning what, how much material that would be using. And I was like, well, could it use less material? And then once I envisioned it as hollow, I was like, well, could this be used for some, reason for something to pass through it, whether it's air or water or some form of like substructure and a larger aggregation, which I would have liked to explore a larger aggregation. But it's it's possible that that is acting as a form of um, passageway for other things. And I think, Lauren, the reason that you normally see, you don't see big solid pieces of copper or other metals, especially in construction, is that it's expensive. Yeah. Sheet exactly. metal is relatively easy to work with and very cheap to, fabri to fabricate. Um, cast monolithic blocks are expensive and inefficient. And they're heavy too. And they're heavy too. <laughs> I think it's kind of funny piggybacking off of our last discussion with the first half of the review is, is it, it almost seems like now we're as a group, we're trying to standardize this process even further. So it's almost like we went all the way to an unstandardized approach. And now we're trying to refine it back with how can we make these joints more universal and more easy to work with. So I think this is kind of a jumping off point coming from our last review was, is, is great because it, you know, I, we, we, we look at the, the middle image and I'm, immediately try to think of how that can be made and how that can be processed. So I think off of what Nick said before is seeing these amazing images at the end, but then also then seeing the process would be extremely beneficial um, just so we could further relate the end image to the, to the act of building it. Mm -hmm. Riley, I'm curious, I mean, can you just expand a little on on that thought the, uh, of the of how I think it's an interesting question like where you see standardization um, right. and and what standardized is process standardized is form shape standardized I mean I, I was just curious where you saw the I think I, I think the whole act of being able to embed these two halves so so like the first image on the left being able to embed half of the cramp joint in each of the stones and then make that joint more easy so that then you're not trying to embed a bow tie into two pieces. You're then trying to just connect those two pieces would make it a lot easier. And therefore I think more standardized um, because you would have these two building pieces and you could quickly put them together on site as opposed to having two raw rocks, um, placing them and cutting them and then inserting the bow tie, out, bow tie. I think that's a little bit less of a standardized approach. Um, so this level of refinement, I think, makes it a little bit more standardized, but also a little bit more accessible too, which I think is a big thing. Back in on, on, on Riley's comment, um, the, third, the third model uh, begins to explain or explore the interaction with a third piece. How would you imagine in the, in the, first, in the first option uh, the interaction of being part of a larger system, because you you probably want to to build uh, something larger with this. That the relation between two pieces 
Uh, so the, the, what we were discussing now about the, the ability to put together um, the, the, the cramp into pieces in, in the stone and that would be easier. How would that relate to the compromises of relation between these two pieces with a number of other pieces that would be uh, making something else? How do you imagine that? I must admit, I didn't imagine um, a larger congregation within the first example, but thinking forwards into it, I can imagine the placement of the cramps might change. You might have multiple cramps in stone allowing for one stone to connect to multiple cramps. Um, and that's creating like a system of it. I could see also, as you all have mentioned, the stacking of them and how they interlock because of the rotation of the cramps. Um, I can also see them being connected through the hollow spaces of the um, cramp uh, as it's um, hollow as of now. So I guess those are the possibilities I can think of off the top of my head right now. I think going off of my past comment about standardization, one, one more thing that I'm noticing is you've, you've picked stones that all share the same angles and they fit kind of nicely together. And, and, and I assume that was a layer of selective thinking and, and how you would do that. So I think as kind of a next departure point to kind of completely destandardize it, have two stones that might not look like they would connect in the beginning. Um, I think that would kind of intrigue me a lot more next. Yeah, I did approach it similar to how um, um, stone like cutting and joining is you pick or you find the rocks and you like pick select them specifically for how they're shaped and how they fit together. So I was approaching it like that, but it would be interesting to continue it in a totally different avenue as to two rocks that look like they cannot combine um, nicely. Will you go into a little more detail on the middle prototype? Uh, I understand how a cramp works and I don't want to get into the nerd weeds and maybe we're supposed to, but like with expansion and contraction and like moisture passing through the ones on either end seem to work well. Uh, when you get to the middle one, when I think about expansion and contraction of that metal um, inside, and I don't know how far that little groove and how deep down it goes, uh, again, I start thinking about water getting in there and freezing and expanding and popping off that right side, unless there's weeps or holes that go all the way through, which made me start to brainstorm, well, maybe there's a hole that goes all the way through that you could pin these together. Like, is that a seat belt all the way around or is it just a U that goes in and how is it fixed in there and basic construction? Right. I'll, I mean, if I can... Um, so I did consider the problem like of, um, I don't remember the term, but it's like when the ice, when water gets in and it freezes and expands and cracks the rock. So I was considering that, um, and the problem it would have, and it, um, as I was designing this, um, and one of the things I was thinking about was like, well, possibly if the, um, the, um, cut goes all the way through, might allow for water to drain out of it. But then I was also assuming there's a possibility that water might remain and still cause cracking. And so it would like have to result in the design of the cramp to allow the water to pass like, um, at least under it, maybe not going all the way into the uh, cut or possibly the filling of the cut in some way with metal, which is what led me to my later design with this um, thin bar going, uh, piece of metal going through the cut. So that was my transition when I start, started considering the idea that um, the water might get in and cause cracking was the idea of like, oh, well maybe I should be filling the cut rather than simply inserting a piece into the cut. Is that just a pin? Is that a full width of the cramp? Yes, it's a full width. Good. We um, 
I love this discussion and I love this project. I want to be a little mindful of time, so we, we should move on pretty soon here, but we have time for one or two more comments, I think. You know, I'm just trying to figure out how to, how to jump in. And I mean, I love the work, you know, and it, I mean, I, I just love the, the contrast of the kind of the roughness of the, of the rock and the stone. And, you know, you model, you know, a, a, a rough rock. I mean, just even that alone is a problem is, is a good, is a good design challenge. Uh, my mother collects rocks and she made an, a classifying system for them. Uh, and she made up a really arbitrary set of requirements. Uh, but I think that they're pretty fun, and I think they could be a, a applicable in a maybe in a in a in a similar way to something like this to give design direction objectives. But like, feels good in hand, heart shaped, good for something, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, so like, just makes up these kind of arbitrary but like meaningful descriptors relative to her own interest. But I, I just love it just strictly from the contrast of stone and metal. And, you know, I started to think about like just baseline cultural things, you know, it's so like culturally, what is that? What does that mean? And to me, it's sort of like, it's like returning to the primitive hut or something. It's like a, or like a, or like the tabula rasa meets the, the, the you know, the stark contrasting form or something like that. And so, I, you know, I want you to be aware of like, I know that there's technical stuff, there's te certainly technical stuff, but there's like the cultural implications and ramifications of this, I think are really, really wonderful and lovely. And so, you know, I started thinking about too, like, uh, and I think Adam uses this reference. So it's like uh, in, in, uh, in 2001 Space Odyssey, the, uh, the monolith that arrives at the, on the, in the desert sort of barren landscape. If you haven't seen this film, you all got to see it. It's a stunning moment. And I don't know if you all saw in recent news, the monolith that showed up in like the Utah desert. Y'all see that? That's what this is, right? So you're designing that and somebody designed that thing and stuck that out in the world. And I like to imagine it was like Robert Irwin, you know, a land artist who would just go into the desert and, you know, make these things and not tell anybody you know, that he was putting art out into the, into the world. And then maybe somebody would happen upon it and, and they'd find it and see it, you know, and I, I don't know, I'm just thinking like different, all the different things that sort of jump into my head. Um, I also put, I, I sent Adam a link to an article called Robin uh, by Robin Evans from the projective cast called drawn stone. And, you know, it's kind of, it's interesting. Um, and you're, you're all up to different things, but it's about the precision of stone cutting. You know, you're doing a different thing here. You're doing a different thing, but um, there's, I love the idea of precision aesthetics relative to starting with a block of rock and then a very, you know, uh, man-made material of metal. But the Evans text, I think it goes through a neat history of the aesthetics related to, or the techniques, I should say, the techniques related to cutting stone. Um, and uh, anyway, but it's, it's beautiful, it's beautiful work. Thank you. I actually, I'd love to read something about cutting stone. So I'm like, I just, I didn't read as much as I would have liked, especially um, getting into the later prototype stages and like wanting to read and like learn more about exactly like how stone cutting works. Cause like I could easily find pictures of stones being cut by saws, but it would, it would been excellent to like actually read someone talking about the, the ins and outs of it or like how the progression of it changed. That would be really interesting. I, I dropped more it in the chat so you can get the PDF out of there. And then I had to throw in some dolmens too. <laughs> I don't know. I, I was I was chatting with Adam too and about the dolmens. But I mean, if you y'all, I think y'all know the dolmen project uh, by First Office. Definitely worth taking a look at. And I put in the in the chat not dolmens and more dolmens. So do with that what you want, but you're not doing dolmens, but dolmens are certainly an ally. It's, it's really well said. I mean, the, it's funny, the, um, uh, I can't, down, I haven't been able to yet download that article and I don't, I'm trying to remember if I've read it or not, um, but certainly the, just the reference of even Robin Evans uh, fits in nicely you know, like, like a cramp um, with the, where Professor Norman Trilloff was kind of saying how this whole exercise overlaps with this, it's like description itself. I mean, Robin Evans obviously writes a lot about 
um, how architects describe and drawing and the fact that, um, and descriptive geometry as well is kind of uh, one of the topics, you know, like one of the issues at stake here and where, where you draw the line. I'm making a, a, a few too many puns here, but, um, but I think there's really an interesting territory there and like Robert Evans even just writing about drawing and representation and how does that work for us and where does it fail for us? Um, and related, I think that that notion of um, of culture, like I don't think it's a coincidence. I mean, maybe it is to some extent, but like all the references that you showed and the kind of dolmens and so forth, like were these, you know, um, they weren't banal moments, right? They were these like they look like they were grand moments from a palace or so, you know what I mean? They weren't just kind of like, and here's how they built houses in you know the average person's house in the you know something something BC or something. Um, you know, they were, these were the remaining iconic ruins of a civilization, which is again, giving import to that um, tactility or something here. Uh, lastly, I couldn't help but think of have been as well, um, uh, Violet Ledoux, who is perhaps the author or the original, the origins of descriptive geometry and structure and assembly and standardization, right? Um, spent, uh, little known fact, um, the final portion of his career drawing mountains. Um, and First Office has written about this as, as well, but um, uh, no, he, he's, he literally, I think, was in the mountains and um, uh, it was just became con consumed by cartography and representation um, and like, uh, you know, drawing um, like views of mountains that couldn't be seen and I idealizing and so forth, which is uh, maybe a little bit like trying to draw the coastline, just both a metaphor and a, um, interesting exercise. But I, no, I, it is, it's it's funny you mentioned that. I just downloaded. Do you know, you know how to use Turbo Squid, which is based in New Orleans, by the way, the company. Turbo Squid. Headquartered, really? headquartered in New Orleans. Yeah, I've always wanted oh, to get them in for some. <laughs> but I, was on, I spent way too much time on their website yesterday. I was looking for like entourage kind of stuff. But anyways, I found a, an amazing mountain range. And it, I started like, like just playing with how to represent the mountains in Rhino. And it was really fascinating because like, it, like just, I mean, this is a different subject, but I mean, I think like just the, the way in which you describe and render and draw and describe uh, these kind of objects and forms that don't really have the same kind of linearity or planarity or geometry that we're familiar with. They have their own sort of methods of description that require kind of a novel uh, kind of rediscovery of what it means to tell the story of something through line work. And uh, that's something that I get pretty excited about. I mean, Lauren, I, I, I could have asked for um, a better conversation about this. I think you probably saw some of these things coming, but it seemed to just be a validation of, of your work. It's, they're beautiful images. Um, it's a wonderful research. I know you're not showing everything. You, it's, it's a really robust um, oh, um, study. It's in the concept board. I thought right. it was this, it's the same link though, I think. Okay, so I think yeah. it's concept. But it, regardless, Lauren, it's just a really, um, uh, this represents a really accomplished um, body of work and charting your course um, from the beginning of the studio to the end is, is remarkable. It's fantastic presentation, um, my highest compliments. Um, we should move on. Um, we went a little over a half an hour, but we, we ha again have a little buffer. Um, and uh, Nick, um, please take it away. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, I uh, would like to, uh, before we begin, preface uh, this presentation with a small anecdote, um, especially for those of you um, who are joining us for the second half um, of this review. It might uh, better position some of the work. Um, so uh, last week, I actually purchased uh, a bag of um, pea gravel at um, the hardware store uh, to put in a flower bed. Um, and I had this assumption that uh, the rocks would all generally be, you know, of the same size. Um, but rather intriguingly, when I got home, uh, realized that each rock is completely unique onto the next, um, a unique size, shape, color, and texture. Um, 
Further, I mean, a, a similar bag of rocks can be found, you know, at nearly every hardware store um, across the country. Um, and of course, each bag is labeled, you know, 25 pounds of pea gravel. Um, yet each stone within that, that bag is, is drastically different from the next. Um, and, and of course, each bag is a unique mix of unique stones. Um, and uh, one realization through the course of the studio is that those same principles apply uh, to nearly every processed construction material um, that we've used, uh, that we, we have come to know. So with that said, um, I will um, be discussing stone to stone connections, um, specifically unjoined connections. Uh, these rely uh, solely upon geometrical precision and placement um, to mitigate the need for additional interventions like cramps and mortar. Um, primarily and historically, um, this connection method, unjoined stone to stone, materializes as stone wall assemblies, corbel arches, and various gabion systems. Um, early stone masons, rather than generalizing the qualities like shape and size, of stone um, uh, and reducing information, um, the, the resolution of that information sought to pay special attention to the geometry of stones used as some are better suited um, for these unjoined connections than others. Due to the irregularity of stone shape, um, as said, the placement of stone within an assembly um, exists on a spectrum of standardization. Uh, stone in a corporal arch is precisely laid whereas stone in a gabion is rather haphazardly dumped in. Regardless of the placement technique, these assemblies, uh, these assembly typologies employ a dry mix um, to fill interstitial, uh, a dry matrix to fill interstitial spaces, a method that relies on specific placement to hold the assemblages together with friction. Uh, Gabians form the focus of this body of research as they, um, in my opinion, rather uh, intriguingly straddle the duality of standard versus non-standard. Um, a standardized box of rather ununiform rock. Uh, beginning during the Italian Renaissance, uh, the Gabion um, began as a handwoven cylindrical basket of sorts filled with any available earthen material. Its purpose was to protect frontline soldiers from artillery fire. These early Gabions required hours to fabricate by hand and were often unwieldy. Following the Industrial Revolution, a revised version of the Gabion could be assembled in mere minutes and could be packed flatly away as a result of the standardization of its components. To this day, whether on the battlefield or on an eroding riverbank, gabions still employ methods of flat packing and rapid deployment. Further, this standardization allows for the aggre aggregation of multiple gabions into one rather seamless assembly as seen in the top um, images. Of the various types of uh, gabions, the welded gabion is commonly used because it provides a rigidity that the others lack. Though gabions come in a variety of materials, the welded steel wire is utilized in the following body of research because of its propensity to resist deformation. Um, it also has the benefit of anti-corrosive properties, a necessity when placed adjacent to stone or soil. Gabion panel components are attached to one another through various means. Um, the explorations to follow utilize the spiral wire connection as it is least cumbersome to implement and can be done by hand. Additionally, it is necessary that the gravel fill of a gabion be of a particular size and shape to reduce settling over time. Uh, finally, understanding the aforementioned components, tools and processes is essential to reassert control over the construction process of gabions rather than to assume a pre-existing archetype. Thinking outside of the box. <laughs> um, at, its, uh, at its core, the following investigations speculate about practices of standardization through the implementation of digital technologies like 3D scanning. The first pair of prototypes expand upon the matrix of stone assemblages. Um, these position the gabion as an interstitial intervention, one that works in conjunction with large stone rubble. In opposition to the previous two prototypes, this pair investigates a typical gabion 
as a vessel which the stone rubble intercedes. Uh, the next pair of prototypical designs position stone rubble as a possible connection point for other methods of connection, um, those of which have been and will be um, discussed um, today. The fourth design explores the possibility of, um, oops, wrong direction, <laughs> there we go. Uh, the fourth design explores the possibilities of a gabion which is scribed or form-fitted nearly exactly to a large piece of rubble. This system comprises of only five panels and the large stone acts as the sixth bottom panel in the system. As an extension of the previous designs, this final iteration builds upon an existing stone wall assembly with a form-fitting gabion system. The system stabilizes the rock wall um, and bridges the non-standard geometry of the stone with, standard, uh, with the standardized geometry of the gabion. Um, it, it is of my opinion <laughs> that together uh, these acknowledge and examine the fine line between placed and dumped or standard and non-standard prescribed and explorative. Um, there are inherent trade-offs to these prototypes when compared to traditional methodologies, computational power in lieu of physical labor, for instance, or the efficiency of standard materials for the reuse of unprocessed ones, or the negotiation of form rather than assuming a predetermined one. Um, that said, these in no way attempt um, to solve issues of global markets driven by um, consumption of commodity. The pseudo standardization of that bag of rocks that I purchased is a gross oversimplification of the unique materiality of those stones in pursuit of efficiency. Hopefully though, this body of research allows those who build and design the opportunity to question the hegemonic and prescriptive methods imposed upon us at the hardware store. Thank you. The hegemony of the hardware store. <laughs> what a way to end. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, it's beautiful work. I mean, it's just absolutely gorgeous. I, I, um, I, mean, I, I yeah. am remote also, so these are renderings. <laughs> um, I tried my best to illustrate what um, I would have otherwise had the opportunity to construct in person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, one of, part of the, the question, and this is like kind of an interesting aesthetic question to me, is this kind of difference between standard and non-standard. And I think, you know, the, I think that's a fundamental premise of the studio. But um, I think aesthetically, like there's a real kind of intrigue there that's a little bit ambiguous, you know? And I start thinking about one time in practice, a long time ago, and I was working in an office and I was developing a facade for a building. My task was to make a randomized pattern for the facade. Seems simple enough. Well, my friend had a script that was a randomizing script. And so mathematically, it was random. But it didn't have the appearance of randomness when I ran the script against the surface. So my, my point is, is that, again, this is another cultural question. So culturally, you know, how are we ingrained or trained to see things as standard or non-standard so that we question them with that kind of purposeful ambiguity if that's the objective? So like, what does it mean that I think that something that has the appearance of non-standardness is actually not standard in its own right and, so, and vice versa? And so I love the tension that the work sort of participates in and promotes because on one hand you can like, you know, just looking at your concept board, you know, thinking about the ones that are trained in the Gabion or the ones that are sort of lumped either in and around the Gabion, which ones are actually standard, which ones are, and the tension is there and that's beautiful. Now, you know, the, the, the cute, most curious ones to me, my favorite one I think is the triangle, like, you know, the, the one before the, the keystone and the arch, you know, um, it's just awesome. But yeah. uh, you reminded me of one note too, I think to next point um, earlier about a jig. Um, one of the interesting side effects, I think, of um, these gabions is that they, uh, as constructed, sort of form their own jig for the stones to be um, intercepted with. Um, and that was just another interesting takeaway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had to. Um... 
Uh, I agree. Beautiful work. I have to say my, my, uh, my heart sank a little when you chose the, the most rigid system because it resists deformation the most. It feels like that's what this class is trying, this studio is trying to, to veer away from. It feels like, like I could challenge you and say, well, you pick the one that makes right angles because construction these days is, is right angles. And it seems like, like I remember when Adam presented the studio, he showed that image, and I think it's on the syllabus, of these right-angled pieces of wood coming out of this beautifully organic tree, kind of showing how ridiculous we are in our system right now. Um, and so I loved the idea of one that didn't resist deformation. And, and I feel like your last rendering is a beautiful example of maybe if you had gone with a material that doesn't resist deformation, they would meet beautifully, perhaps. Ex like, yeah. I just you know, imagine having to build that versus having a material that would do it for you. Um, the, the dumbest example I could think of, because I can't think of any, another one fast enough, is that thing where you, sh all those pins that you shove your hand on, right? It's got this rigid system, but all these pins, and it meets something perfectly, right? This, maybe there's some sort of hybrid solution uh, as a step forward that meets the, the right angled conditions of the construction industry that I think is why you picked the system that resists deformation with something that welcomes or receives deformation. Yeah, I think um, one opportunity uh, to do exactly that would be to utilize um, the we, uh, woven wire mesh um, in these instances where, you know, uh, the form is fitted to the stone. Um, I think that is an excellent candidate. Um, but you, I think you are correct in the assumption that um, the, the rigid, the more rigid welded system was chosen. Um, I think partially because as much as I've tried, I'm still attached to conventional methods of construction. Um, as Professor Modison has said, you know, we're not going to go and live in, in mud huts, perhaps, but uh, part of me is still tied to um, the notion that these could attach to other systems or, you know, perhaps serve as a foundation for a house or um, a, a base for um, a wall or, you know, a load bearing wall or, or um, whatnot. So. And it was more of a challenge for, for myself, I think, to um, imagine the two um, formally very different um, concepts to come together, um, perhaps in a very literal way. Nick, uh, I, 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 I follow up Andrew's uh, comment because it's, it's very clear. Uh, I don't know if this has some, if this is a, a, an interesting uh, moment in, in which we can think about what happens with uh, fabrication uh, exercise that has no fabrication and is and is uh, and is renders uh, because uh, so that I, I was surprised by your choice uh, your choice of the of the wire mess as as Andrew was um, and there's an issue of what the mess uh, does no uh, it's basically a working in traction because the compression is is uh, is made by the by the stone, no, and the gabion works in in traction, no, uh, holding the pieces together, no. So in some of your examples, that's not the case, no. The 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 integrity of the or of the effort would be first uh, made by the by the gabions. So um, I, I think it's an interesting uh, exercise that you have done that that you could now uh, make a, a criticism. Uh, of uh, what are the explorations that have become graphic explorations and what are the explorations that have uh, a material uh, interest. I, 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 was, I was wondering of, um, if, uh, if you would have uh, thought uh, not only outside the box, but outside the, the wire. <laughs> uh, because uh, I found very interesting the, the your your historic uh, references, and and perhaps there's an opportunity to pick up at some point instead of continuing with the last uh, version of what we are used to uh, to see what what you could uh, obtain of that. No, especially when we think that we now can uh, add other processes. Uh, 
uh, that we can integrate in this. No, if 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 we think in the in the in the gradient made by something that is temporary, and over time there's another process that is substituting the 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 role of the gradient uh, of the structure of the gradient. No? Or, or even in the, I found very interesting the military revision. If, and and I know it's very, very close to you, but but what what would be the the emergency revision uh, of that? No, what would be the the Gavion, uh, system that would be useful uh, to deploy in Lake Charles or in many other places in which you suddenly have a lot of debris that you don't want to throw uh, to the landfill, but you know you can use it in different times. So what would be that new system of gavion, of holding pieces together, or whatever you want to call it, that allows you to reuse uh, materials in a different way? No? So I think I, I'm, I, I'm very interested in, in, in all the lines that you have described and maybe less in the final product and the, and the beautiful uh, fictions, <laughs> which are beautiful, but <laughs> I, I'm interested in a little bit more disturbed beauty that I'm sure you, you, are, you are very good at as well. Uh, so so I, I, it would be interesting the, the post-processing of all this uh, work that you have done. I, I completely agree, um, and I love that you brought up the, the two examples of um, perhaps a Gabion that is, is uh, reminiscent of the sort of wicker, um, you know, reed uh, woven Gabions, um, because that wasn't an, uh, an idea that got thrown around at one point, um, and also the idea of very strictly reusing uh, debris. Um, both of those ideas actually were thrown around. Um, and a, an interesting parallel uh, just in my investigation was that um, the sack gabion, the deformable uh, made of a polymer plastic mesh gabion was actually used here in New Orleans after Katrina um, to shore up the levees, um, which had been um, destroyed or, or damaged. So um, an interesting parallel to our present, uh, present place. Thank you. Um. I think those were, you know, invaluable comments. And Nick, I've watched your, your process evolve, and I know you're beset by um, external challenges during this, during this semester and, and this exercise. But certainly, um, I think um, you might want to rewatch the video and just kind of take those comments in again um, from Dean Alde and, um, and from the other critics, because it really reflects a kind of a I, I think you struggled a lot along the way um, with trying to build something from a prescribed form and kind of reverse engineer backwards, you know, and like um, I, you're, it's a good comment that I, 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 I mean, it's an insightful comment because I've watched you do this fascinating body of research, look at these flexible adaptive systems, you know, that are like, you know, on site, no skill, this and that. And then, um, and then design a series of geometries that just kind of like shove a gabion in there literally, right? Um, you know, as kind of Andrew cited with the, the rigid members. And, um, I, I think looking, um, it, it's a bit of an exercise um, or this, there's looking backwards, there's a, this exercise um, can put into relief for you next to the degree to which like, um, you have pursued a, again, an idealized uh, have something prescribed in your mind that you pursue rather than kind of using your research as an evolutionary process that lets you explore, question, probe. And I think there would have been a lot of possibilities or that rather this project opens up the possibilities of, you know, what does a kind of semi-fabricated mean? <laughs> you know, what, what is semi-digital? Um, you know, that, I think that's amazing territory. Relates to what um, Ben said about the, um, you know, cited with the dolmens and uh, and others, you know, kind of, um, and this also relates to what uh, I, Bruce had said too about the issue of additive versus subtractive and kind of where the thresholds lie. And I, you had great territory too with the blurring of those two, you know, this was kind of a, the matrix um, 
and the mortar and so forth. And then they always became a sort of like, you literally delineated them with wire, right? Um, so they're, they're beautiful images and, a, and really a great setup for um, maybe um, reflecting even on your own work um, and certainly the topics of the studio. Um, Nick, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Uh, good luck with your peak rebel um, purchases. Am I allowed so to say one quick comment? Oh, please, yes, process. absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah. I want to say something else too before. Okay, I, please. We have I just, uh, this might be a tangent, so I don't know if Ben wants to go first, but the last three uh, images of your process show what looks like rocks encapsulated, encapsulated by silly string. And I love this idea. What I like about that one is it feels like in the in your final scheme, the Gabian was in charge. I think Dean Alday was saying this. The frame is in charge and the rocks play the supporting role. If they don't fit in there, they're not allowed. But I love that these three images feel like, like I could see a big pile of rubble that you then sprayed like gunite when you make a pool, but you spray some sort of galvanized wire mesh that hardens and now you have a wall. It feels like they're more working together as opposed to if one's not this right shape, it's not gonna go there, right? It reminds me of like how canoes, old P-rows used to be made by a whole tree that you carve out. And now if you've any watched make someone make a fiberglass canoe, it's completely additive. Now, right, you have the void of what is going to be a canoe and then you layer fiberglass in it and it becomes one. So there, there's some beautiful, um, I like the idea that it doesn't matter what the size the rubble is, um, uh, it's still part of this system. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the thought that I just had, it relates, I think, to um, Adam's comment about the prescribed form and then reverse engineering it. And I think like that's a, it's a really important observation. And I was trying to think what a counter, a counterpoint to that would be. And I started thinking, okay, I have one from my own experience. Has anybody ever built a riprap wall? Riprap, y'all know what riprap is? Yeah. Loose stones to, to help the shoreline. Mm -hmm. So in, in Minnesota, it's very common that the ice will destroy the shoreline at Minnesotans' cabins or their lake homes. And so my parents, when I was growing up, had a, had a lake home where the shoreline was destroyed. And I had to rebuild a riprap wall on the shoreline. And I don't know if anybody's ever done that, but it'd be, a, I'd be interested to see like stage three of this, where the students go and build a riprap rip wall maybe. <laughs> but what happened was, is a big, huge semi pulled up and just dumped off a bunch of rocks, just a pile of boulders. And I was by myself, I'd never pushed rocks before. It was like Sisyphus, you know? And basically I just had to like manually lift rock and move it into the berm and then rebuild the shoreline. And so like, I think what was fascinating to me about that in relation to this perhaps is like, um, it's like aggregate, there's a site there, there's a desired goal, but there isn't like a, like the cube doesn't exist. The cube is more amorphous, but you have an objective and the rock has to perform the objective. And so like, I don't know if it's exactly a counterpoint, but a riprap wall could be an exciting, exciting alternative to a gabion. Uh, <laughs> my back, my back has never recovered. I'll just, I'll say. <laughs> um, and I wonder if uh, it'd be interesting to see if the extent to which, like, did you author that, or just to consider the extent to which you authored your riprap wall versus were just like the labor for like, and I once you have the idea of a riprap wall, it's just like however it gets built. There's no <laughs> authorship. Are there different styles of riprap? I was um, twenty. I was twenty when I did mine. And I didn't even know what architecture was. <laughs> I just want to add, I had to do that and cart uh, rocks across the lake with a jet ski and a um, rowboat in tow. <laughs> Fantastic. Which is, also happens to be the methodology for the next studio in the sequence. Um, more on that later. Um, uh, be, a, be a TA. <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, you're, you're qualified to come teach that one. Okay. Um, uh, uh thank you nick and um and andrew and, and ben please um, i always welcome your your comments don't hold back um the and and your anecdotes um we have one more and it's a group of three and three 
um, in-person students. So we'll see physical work. Uh, Melina, Hayden, and Zach, please take it away. All right, I'm Melina Pickard, and this is the Stone to Wood. Stone to Wood connections have been a central component of historical architecture. However, with the modernization of technology and building practices and materials, stone to wood is far less common. At the core of stone to wood connections is the struggle of connecting a measurable uniform shape, such as a two by four, to an irregular surface, such as a heavily aggregated stone. Historic practices have mastered this difficult task, although these techniques are time consuming and leave room for human error. The questions asked through this research is what is the potential of digital technology when applied to traditional stone to wood precision connection methods? And how can digital technologies allow us to work directly with materials as found? This is the exploration of tolerance, resolution, precision, and strength of these digital technologies with these materials and connection types. Hi there, um, my name is Hayden Boyce and I'll be walking through some of the, these historic connection types. So uh, we researched and explored four different connection types, uh, Ishibatate, Ban Timber, uh, and two types found in stone masonry walls. Uh, Ishibatate is the process of raising a traditional timber structure and resting the columns and stones in the ground. Um, developed as a means for earthquake resistance, the flexibility of wood and the fact that the wood and stone are unjoined allow for the structure to move as one in the event of tremors. Additionally, a timber frame raised off of the ground on stones makes the wood less susceptible to the effects of moisture uh, because water can just run off the wood and into the stone, which will then distribute it to the ground, which acts as termite resistance. Um, and this practice is typically achieved by scribing wood to stone. Um, bond timber, uh, also known as half timbering, utilizes a timber substructure within a masonry stone or mud infill wall. Uh, the wood acts as reinforcement in an otherwise laterally weak masonry wall. Um, and this wood to stone connection is typically joined with an application of mortar. Um, and then the remaining two connection types studied uh, were those which exist in many stone masonry walls. Um, historically, stone foundations and walls were used as means to distribute loads to prevent subsiding and sinking. However, wooden structures had to be implemented in the roof or uh, throughout the whole interior structure to lighten loads and increase lateral stability. Uh, the first of these connections is where uh, timber joists meet the stone exterior walls. Um, the joists typically spanning wall to wall and the wood resting in a cavity in the wall or on top of a protruding stone. Uh, and then the second uh, stone masonry connection is where the roof's wall or eave plate uh, rests on top of the stone masonry wall. This is achieved by making the top of a wall as even as possible and resting the wood typically without mortar, uh, resulting in an unsealed exterior condition. Fundamentally, these connection types of traditional construction methods exist uh, out of the necessity for wood and stone to make up for each other's weaknesses. The wood to stone connection is one which transitions from the solid water resistant yet irregular stone to the regular malleable and structural wood. Inspired by the historic methods, the rest of the project investigates the potential of these connections through the lens of digital technology and found material. Through a series of prototypes, we are able to test and explore how the 3D scanners, the digital modeling softwares, and the CNC mill can work together to push the limits of these traditional connection methods. Let this process and prototyping be the window into the potential of this topic of research. Based on accessibility and our initial research, these are our selection of found stones to be scanned for prototyping. There is a combination of heavily aggregated stones and smooth compacted stones with defined ridges. One of the main reasons stone to wood connections have worked is because of the gripping qualities of the aggregate and ridges, which are highlighted here. Here you can see the variety of texture and aggregate size in the rock selections. This variation provides different qualities to the connections themselves. The rocks are scanned using a 3D scanner in order to develop a digital model. The rough texture and defined shapes of the stones are easily identified by the scanner. 3D scanning is efficient, only taking about 15 to 20 minutes per rock to scan, although these rocks are on the smaller side. This is the result of a 3D scanning and processing steps. 
This file can then be converted into mesh for digital modeling. Despite the scans having general success in terms of efficiency and general accuracy, there are still issues of resolution uh, when going from physical to digital. Here you can see the minor differences in the surface of the rock in the scan. The scan, the scan creates the image using points which increase accuracy. Although these variations may appear small, we can assume the differences will only grow as the model continues to bounce between physical and digital. The scans are then transferred into Rhino and converted to mesh. In this digital platform, different assemblies and prototypes can be tested. This is also when the wood component becomes relevant. Similar to the historic method of Ichibitate, the wood connection is shaped into the dominant form of the stone. Through digital modeling, the wood can be modeled to can be manipulated in order to achieve a stable or exploratory connection between the stones. Within the model, the wood component can act as a thin mortar-like connection that only further highlights the rocks, or the wood can take on more of a structural quality, becoming more prominent in the arrangement. Through the final prototypes, we test a range of these qualities of wood connections with the stone. The transfer from the scan to the digital model involves processes such as smoothing, filling holes, and lowering the polysurface count. With the current technology available to us, these edits are all necessary in order to keep the project moving. However, this comes with small inaccuracies and a lower resolution than the original scan. The digital model is made with lines and surfaces, which further lowers the resolution. These files are used to make the CNC cut files for the wood connection pieces. Therefore, the resolution of the wood can only be as high as these files. The process for uh, CNC milling um, is first to um, uh, make a, a 3D model of the wood to be milled, um, and then it is programmed um, and then secured to the CNC bed uh, with uh, screws and wooden support jigs to hold it down. Um, as we cannot screw into the wood itself, uh, it needs to be uh, held from the side so it does not um, rise up in the uh, cutting process. Uh, and then the uh, mesh negative from the scan rocks is milled out in varying resolutions up to a 1 16th finish margin of error. Uh, due uh, to having access to a three and C or three axis CNC machine, um, all cuts had to be top down, which means that any overhanging geometry cannot be cut. Uh, the bits of the CNC machine are also uh, much skinnier than the tool holder that holds them to the machine. Uh, so steep geometries uh, had to be milled with the caution of tool holder collisions, um, which limits the uh, how um, steep of a um, rock mesh that we can cut. Um, finally, the rotation of, of the bits with their rounded edges meant that every pass was milled with a radius of some sort. Uh, while mostly inconsequential, a CNC milled cut will never perfectly match the actual surface of a rock. With the limitations of the drill bit and the models themselves, the resolution throughout the process weakens as displayed here. And with this close up, you can really see the inaccuracies or the intricacies of these phases and how the definition slowly weakens and changes. The milled wood is then aligned with the mirroring ridges and aggregates of the stone and fits into place. Uh, with the compounding of the lessened resolution throughout the process, the final mill cuts do not always match uh, with the entirety of the rock's edges. The highlighted gaps show the possible limitations of these digital tools or perhaps the need for reevaluation of the process itself. Throughout the process, there is a compounding of lessening resolution, precision, and tolerance, which is shown in this diagram. Although the majority of the major ridges and aggregates are visible throughout the process, there is a clear softening of resolution, which leads to imprecision in the final physical prototype. Melina, do you mind just playing that one more time? Yes, I'll see if I can. <laughs> I've had some problems with it. Um, I'm not sure I can play it again. I can play it at the end again. Yeah, no problem. Throughout the process, there is a compounding of lessening resolution. Oh, I'm sorry. In order to further test the potential of these digital technologies, different arrangements and prototypes or and types of connections need to be tested. 
This specific test explores the strength of a stone wood connection as the top stone is precariously resting on the wood until it lo is locked into place with the milled grooves of the wood. The wood in this assembly acts as a structural component and becomes a substantial object rather than just a connection device. This prototype tested the ability of the CNC mill with its potential need to flip mill. Ultimately, this is not an efficient method of milling, so the connection had to be cut in half to be milled and then re-glued, resulting in a longer wood connection. Despite this deviation in the original method, the milling was able to secure the top rock, which is which was precariously angled, showing off the potential strength of the aggregated grip uh, on the milled wood. As Hayden was saying before, this prototype had a steeper portion to accommodate the harsh slope of the stone. Uh, as can be seen here on the right, uh, the steeper the slope gets, the more resolution is lost uh, due to uh, the avoidance of the bit colliding with the wood. The third prototype tested uh, Third product I tested was an arch of sorts. Two stones leaned against each other with a small milled piece of wood acting as a keystone. The piece was designed with the purpose of present, uh, preventing the stones from sliding out from the bottom or pulling apart from the top. This prototype worked relatively well with the only issue being the balance of the stones themselves. The fourth prototype was uh, examine, uh, examining the milled wood piece as a mortar of sorts. The wood piece is used to bind the stones together, locking them in place. The larger stone was placed at the bottom, acting as a base for the others. Wood would then be snapped into place on top of it before uh, snapping the two upper stones into place. While mortar is purely an additive process, the milling process was subtractive, taking out volume from the original piece of wood to contour to the stone. The final prototype we designed was the tower prototype. This seek to use the wood pieces as legs and enlarge the scale of our exploration. A milled base was allowed for stones on the bottom to have a locked and resting place. The connections coming off of these stones were inspired by Ishibatate and carried the uh, load of at least one other stone. The stones were organized in a manner that allowed them to, uh, to support the largest stone at the top where three pieces of, mill wood, uh, of milled wood would hold it. Throughout this process of exploration, we examine many different connection types between stone and wood. Existing technologies, while they have their own capacity for error, allow for a more streamlined process of enhancing these materials. While the materials themselves may have their natural regular shapes, the process itself was standardized. This allowed for a process that required an additional upfront time investment for scanning and analysis while saving time in other parts of the process. Thank you. How good was the three D scanner? Um, it was it was uh, pretty good. Um, I think it, it de there definitely was a learning curve, and we got better at it as time went on. Um, it's not necessarily just a question of the, how good the three D scanner was, because you did have to lower the resolution in order for a computer to be able to process it. So, um, how powerful your computer is is also a determining factor in the resolution. Is this, this is a render, is it? Yeah, this is a render, this final one. So that, that is not uh, tested? Yeah, this one was not tested, no. Why not? Um, yeah, th thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I think it's really clear going from these small prototypes and imagining on the larger scale. Um, I. I guess I was just a little bit curious about like the using just milling. I think there maybe could have been possibilities of like casting or potentially using 3D printing to create these connections. Um, I think there's like plenty of projects where it's using like standardized materials and then creating like a 3D printed connection to like lock pipes together. Um, but then the possibility of using scanning and you have these really precise 3D models, you wouldn't have to go through all of those layers of resolution, resolution, resolution loss. Um, but you can like 3D print that actual form and lock it together. Um, did you consider that in the process? Um, with the limited time we had, we were more focused on like um, focusing on the uh, the strictly the stone and wood materials. Um, yeah. 
And I mean, I, I think I think if, since there was three of you, I think one of you could have ex been exploring that. Yeah. I think um, the reason we stuck mostly with wood as well um, is that we were exploring sort of like the fundamental properties of why uh, these stone and wood connections exist uh, and that um, like the two are sort of um, making up for each other's weaknesses weaknesses and that um, wood is um, has a very high uh, gripping quality or gripping strength to the stone um, and so the change in material would have kind of made the connections fundamentally different and um, I, I have a question um, what was the process of of uh, deciding the exploration of the last prototype because in the in the previous explorations you basically are using the boot as a joint or sometimes even as a as a mortar almost and, and in the last test uh, the boot becomes the <clears throat> the structural element uh, as opposed to the to the stone as the as the main tectonic piece, why 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 is this? Um, we do actually have a couple of pieces here um, in this particular picture. If you can see on the lower right, and I believe the one right in front, um, those connections were used more uh, as a mortar. Um, but we did want to kind of further the exploration. This was not seen necessarily as like a final prototype, but more of as like kind of a next step. It would be interesting in, in this next step, uh, what else the stone can do uh, besides being like inserted in the in the wooden structure in the sense of how the stone would help to keep uh, horizontal stability, for instance, to this. How do you imagine that? Zach, Melina, Hayden, are you thinking or? Oh, sorry, was that a, was that a question? I, I couldn't quite hear the last bit of it. But, yeah. No, I, I was wondering if, if you were thinking in, in the role of the stone, besides being holded to be part of the, of the structural system, stabilizing, for instance, the horizontal um, efforts that this uh, structure would be facing. Um, yeah, I think we tended to view the wood as the stabilizing element um, in most of these. Uh, it was a way of achieving a certain form um, with the rocks that we were uh, that we had found and uh, using the rocks in their found form. Uh, so I guess in that in in that sense, uh, I, the wood was used more to achieve the goal. I guess uh, in a structural sense. So. But I, I, I think, you know, this is th that question of like the role of this wood versus stone, what's structural and what's not and how, like, obviously you're exploring that. Um, but I think, um, you know, Dean Alda is jumping to the heart of your project and how you, how you define these terms. And by presenting this tower in a way, right? Like your this tower is framing your past exercises and it and you are I you are saying that they are leading up to they are adding up and these explanations to adding up to this. And and my sense is from your past exercise that it was limited in a way or, or more narrowly focused on say the tolerances between the materials and uh, or, you know, of the processes and the materials and how those kind of joints worked or didn't work um, with the ratio of texture units to rock texture units to wood gripping units. Um, these are imaginary units, but, you know, you get the idea. Um, and in, in my mind, like the, the kind of that would lead to um, a study of like, well, what's the minimal amount of wood that could be used or, uh, you know, what's, what's the, and minimal and say in terms of volume, minimal in terms of width of these 
minimal in terms of depth, you know, um, what's a hybrid structure. Um, and this sort of pulls away from that, and perhaps even does your work a disservice. I know that you have the different pieces in there, um, uh, you know, but, and I was kind of, in a way, it's sort of an example of different pieces at different scales, but, you know, really testing, they're all the same width, right? They're all vertical. There's a kind of, there's a sort of like um, rigid logic to it. And, and one, and I, I, I think it's, again, I think it's a disservice to this, like a very fantastic set of explorations to focus too much on this final prototype. Um, but at the same time, like, the, uh, like Dean Alde said, this is sort of charting the direction of your work. And um, I don't wanna uh, monopolize too much, but I, I think what could have helped you is to, um, is the research phase like remained somewhat impoverished, right? It was like Ishibatate and like half timbering and then a few images that I saw again and again. Um, and there's a lot else out there. Um, okay. Just picking up, um, I think, you know, I don't wanna to put too much on your comment, um, Dean Alte, but you, uh, at some point, I think in a presentation you gave, you, you referenced um, Joreos, am I saying that right? Uh, I can't roll my R, but these like, there's these structures in Spain that are for storing grain and similar to like preventing termites, it's like preventing bugs go up. But they're all these like, uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed to characterize them too much because I've it's a quick drive and I've seen a few of them or whatever. But um, uh, there's a lot of sources throughout history that you could tap of these kind of craft and craft non-standard material assemblages that function in a variety of ways and kind of invert even the, you know, well, anyway, I, I think that um, just to summarize, um, you know, uh, um, uh, yeah, I'm not actually going to summarize. I want to leave it to the critics to say, but um, I want to just reinforce that comment because I think it tapped into kind of something that your process, this was sort of like, this doesn't represent the totality of your process. And maybe there's an opportunity just to kind of refocus on rethink that process or re rethink where that process is leading. I think, I think the one I'm most compelled by is where the wood becomes the mortar. Uh, first, beautiful drawings, like these things are amazing, like, uh, like CAD drawings of rocks, like those process ones in the middle, it's pretty impressive. It reminds me of what Ben was saying about drawing mountains. Like, it's like how many little marks you can make to make these, um, what look like sort of, you know, um, melting stone. And I might be making this project something it's not, but where the wood becomes the mortar feels like it's questioning how wood operates, which kind of sounds like the goal of the project. Like the final one, it sounds like we're all saying it looks like it's got wood studs or wood columns, which is fairly conventional. But to turn it on its side and use it in small enough portions, I almost feel like I caught the tail end of a previous um, uh, review and it reminded me of Nicholas talking about seeing all this all these residences laid waste in Lake Charles and like I feel like you could actually reuse that wood in this kind of instance if I'm trying to project forward like there's feels like because we're not using it we're using it the non-standard way or you're, you're really thinking what else could wood be um, you know oh it could be mortar it feels like that one's um, uh, on the verge of an interesting, uh, I'm more compelled by that direction. Was was there any um, talk about how to minimize the amount of wood in there so you have the exact amount of wood needed, nothing more, nothing less, um, to kind of create that wood joint or mortar joint? With our first prototype, that was definitely something we tried to do is use as little wood as possible. And that since it was one of our first trials, uh, we definitely ran into some issues when we were milling and realized we needed more wood. Um, so that was kind of where we came up with the kind of the combination of whether the wood was structural or the wood was more of a mortar to highlight the rock. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was something we to, tried to play with between all the prototypes after that first prototype trial. You know, something that I want to pick up on, I think, is like this idea of materials and expectations. And I think that's, you know, another 
thing that's maybe at the heart of the studio is sort of what is the expectation material and, and how do we gain that? How do we understand that? How do we invert that, subvert that, manipulate that? And so I'm gonna paint three pictures. And I think each of you probably want to pick which persona best identifies you and your, your relationship to materiality. Y'all know Louis Kahn, right? You probably heard the quote, right? You say to Brick, what do you want, Brick? Brick says to you, I like an arch. If you say to Brick, arches are expensive and I can use a concrete lintel over an opening. What do you think of that, Brick? Brick says, I like an arch. Khan, okay? Then there's Jeff Kipnis on Louis Kahn. I don't, this one is maybe more obscure. If you think of Brick, you say to Brick, what do you want, Brick? And Brick says to you, God, I'd love to smoke some pot and become a ballet dancer. Okay, that's Luke, that's Kipnis on Khan. Then there's Gene Gang and the Marble Curtain. This is not a quote, but the Marble Curtain uh, was uh, a project by Gene Gang that took marble, right, uh, and inverted its structural kind of properties. That was the objective of the, of the installation. And so, you know, usually stone, marble, it's good for compression. They inverted that in this project where the curtain was in tension. So it was hanging marble sheets. And so like there, there was inversion, subversion, and sort of uh, extroversion, let's say of those, three, of those three scenarios. And I think each of you probably has your own predisposition to one of those realities. And none of them are right, none of them are wrong. But I think what you can do is start to make decisions that work toward an objective that has a clear end goal in mind. And so that's where you would start to translate, you know, direct sort of research for the sake of research to applied research, I think. And, um, you know, again, none of those are the right solution, but they're all a possibility toward a solution. That's just an observation. I'd like to add a comment about the, the, the role that we have seen in these proposals of the, of the rendering in the, in the fabrication studio. Um, and, and in this case, uh, um, I wonder if, if, uh, if it could be more directed to the expansion of the system as opposed to, uh, to an alternative non-fabricated uh, possibility. Uh, for instance, I think this is this is a, a really interesting slide that you have here, um, and it's I think well if you connect this, uh, I think it makes it makes a great sequence with the 1.10 of the tolerance that you have tested the 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 milling of the of the wood to adapt to the to the stone and then to the to to one. Of the of the prototype of the two stones with a piece of wood in, in between, so when when uh, when going from the joint to this kind of almost mortar um, behavior, what what this mortar strange mortar allows, no? and that's I think an, an interesting question and how you can explore that the the systemic uh, expansion of the system. Uh, because uh, when you look at this uh, slide that you have here, this, this is a strange mortar because it has a, its own geometry uh, and, and its own resistance. So I wonder if, if one possibility would be to, to, to see what this system allows for, uh, for joints, but now joints that are between wood pieces, no? between mortars somehow, uh, because this this brings the, the standardized piece of wood that you have brought here in the non-standardized system. And the standardized piece of wood, you have not placed it in any random position. You have placed it with the with the corners perfectly vertical and the and the planes uh, perfectly vertical. So would that I, I, I don't know how intentional is that, but would that allow to begin to think in, in a system that is built 
in this combination of a standardized uh, manipulated wood uh, and the rocks to, to begin to, to create uh, a larger, more complex uh, possibilities. Uh, I wonder if that's one, for instance, uh, an important role that the post-processing of the fabrication in terms of, of rendering uh, would allow to, to extract the lessons that you have uh, found in this in the in the physical fabrication to to the expansion of the exploration. I definitely say that the positioning of the wood was probably was mostly intentional um, in that uh, the role that the wood was playing in most of our explorations were um, I guess I guess just the um, transition between um, how unstable uh, the rock can be and then the wood um, having some sort of dimensionality to it. Uh, could sort of play the role of um, turning the rocks from like it has uh, sort of no direction to it to um, sort of having it up and down um, as sort of like, as was mentioned in the beans, there is really no um, sort of directionality to that. Um, and then the wood um, sort of being this very standard, it has uh, four sides, all right angles um, is sort of the um, kind of a play on the, the weakness of the stone. I'm curious, Zach, Melina, and Hayden, um, to just your, to just, if, you, if you could just give like, uh, I'm curious what your, where you are at with your understanding of what it, what it means to, uh, to borrow the phrase from Dean Alde, that systemic expansion of the system. Like, I, I'm curious how you, I mean, I'm almost curious just how you understand that phrase, but also how what you see as the system to even begin um, systematizing and expanding. Like, what what are there's multiple overlapping systems here, but how do you begin to characterize and even define a system? I think that one of the systems that we definitely thought about in our different prototypes was the role of the wood, and kind of that's what differentiated each of them. Uh, and then the also the process itself. So for different qualities of the wood connection involved different types of milling or like different uh, processes for milling and different processes with the digital modeling. Um, so definitely among our prototypes, how we differentiated them and their systems were through mostly the process. But those are kind of constraints, right? Like, I mean, yeah. I think that those, I mean, that's definitely, definitely with the milling, that was definitely a constraint, I would say. Um, and I think that kind of brings up Nick's point at the beginning about how we could try other techniques to, for cutting the wood or other connection pieces itself. And that can be like the future of the research. Maybe in the, I'm trying to think of examples. And so like, I'm trying to think of my own past. Again, this isn't rip rap, I promise, but this was a little, equally as simple. Uh, and what was maybe clear about it is like, this is rock and wood, right? It's just two things, right? Rock and wood or concrete and wood. And, you know, in a project of my past, I was using wax and water and the two don't really work together too well, but they also work really, really well together. And so each of them have parameters and properties and then systematizing it uh, you know, I was interested in the interaction between wax and water. Okay, just simple. And then the parameters are insolubility, you know, paraffin has a chemical makeup, water has a chemical makeup, et cetera, et cetera. But then you start to control the variables and then you start to assess the differences in the outcomes. And you can start to create taxonomies. That's one sort of ordering principle, but there are other sort of more sort of scientific ordering logics as well that you can start to imagine. But you know, one thing would be to sort of understand the baseline properties that you're working with and then start to create control mechanisms whereby you can start to assess, uh, assess or test outcomes based on the variables that you're starting to tweak. So for example, injection was an important method with the wax and water example. And was it melting, was it injecting melted wax into water or was it injecting water into melted wax? Those produce radically different results. Also changing the temperature, changing the container, changing um, 
you know, the types of the types of objects that were being injected into, you know, all of these different things. Um, but so, you know, you start to then create a catalog and an assessment of the, of the outcomes. And that's just one way. But there's ways to start to understand the variables that you're producing. And then you can evaluate repeatability, unrepeatability, um, you know, mishap, et cetera, et cetera. But the goal, I think, is just to gain intelligence. You know, and intelligence happens in a lot of in a lot of ways. And so you want to, it doesn't always have to be just repeatable, but like, you know, you want to gain sort of a, a facility for how you can um, understand the conditions that you're working under. I don't know if that helps, but, um, you know, similar set of simple parameters. Kind of branching off of what Dean Alde said earlier, um, do we do we want to expand a current system with these building materials, or is it almost more beneficial to completely disregard that current system and then come back to it um, by attaching our newly found knowledge to that current system in order to better gain kind of pr uh, progress within the building field? Just because I feel like when we when we bring kind of the preconceived notions of a current system into our designs, they kind of have an underlying um, kind of impact on it. So to me, it was almost beneficial to see that rock on top of the wood because that's not a typical way of building rock with wood. It's usually the opposite way around. So um, I'm just curious if, if it's better to start with the idea of expanding a current system or completely disregarding that current system. I think in the sense of the survey we were doing, it might, it might be a good way to, to start off. Um, I think at some point that we needed a little bit of guidance. And I think the, the history that we had looked at, I think was kind of our, our guide, uh, our guiding factor in terms of like where we would go next. Yeah. We're getting close to our, our closing time. Um, but, uh, I'll stick around for questions all day, <laughs> a conversation. I love this conversation. I think it's to your credit, um, Zach, Hayden, and Melina to ha have set up this level of uh, conversation um, and that it's since the rest of the studio as well, um, that uh, we are not just talking about the originals, nor are we talking about just here's how the technology worked. We did this, this worked, this didn't work, uh, but the space between the two. And I, I think this question, I've used the word systems and process a lot in the studio. And I think the question of uh, like, um, you're saying Riley, I mean, do we need the previous system? Um, do we need a previous system to build off of or should we explore the tools and then come up with new systems or, or new, uh, let's say uh, new constraints and then reference in the old systems where appropriate. And I, I don't know. I, I, I like, and I hope that the answer is, I don't know for most of you in the studio, um, but you know, with a separate set of questions uh, in, in its place, should we use old systems or should we use reinvent new systems? I hope that the question is almost like, I don't know, but almost like that question doesn't matter, you know, or not that that question doesn't matter, but in its place are a set of new questions that are more nuanced. And I, I do think, um, to this project specifically, um, Hayden, Melina, and Zach, um, that you do need some form of a system, right? Riley, you're saying that you're not, you're saying kind of invent a new system in a way, or like think of the logic, maybe like Ben saying a brick wants to be, I don't know, every time I talk to a brick, I get no answer. So I'm always kind of like <laughs> thinking, maybe that's why I'm not, you know, really kind of different or whatever. But um, I, I, um, uh, uh, I do think there needs to be identifying what a system is. and it can be an appropriation or, or something, but the basic question of, is this mortar or, you know, is this a matrix like Nick cited um, or, you know, is this Ishibitate or some other form of kind of post and beam something um, or you, if absent all those things, defining your own, terms of the system, which maybe is a, is a harder exercise. But my aspiration for the studio is to um, dissect and disassemble 
these historic methods uh, and understand the logics that inform the system. And I think, you know, for example, uh, Lauren McGrath, you showed um, the hand tools, and that explains a lot why those systems were in place. They were in place because people had hands, <laughs> things they, you know, could cut with on their hands. And so, um, and of course, you know, similarly, the um, scales of the projects and the ambitions of the projects are all woven into these complex systems. Um, but the, the, those existing systems to unpack those and then selectively look at those ingredients. I mean, how much is this about the tools you're working with? How much is this about a kind of end goal? How much is this about, um, you know, non-standard, um, you know, being able to use non-standard? And how much is this even about defining what non-standard means? And then this is sort of a, I, I'd like to hand off um, for anyone, uh, any one of our critics with um, closing comments. Um, but uh, one theme that emerged was, a, I think, a presumption that everyone knew what non-standard was in the beginning of the studio, um, and even myself to a degree. And now at the end, almost a kind of a full uncertainty of what non-standard means. Um, and again, not, not, be, not just, uh, uh, you know, a smashing of that um, definition into nothing, but a smashing of it into lots of smaller pieces that, that can then be explored. Also, I think complicating as well, the notion of standards being good or bad. Um, and, you know, uh, Home Depot, good or bad, you know, these kind of polar binary uh, assessments sort of fail under scrutiny. Um, without standards, we'd be everything would be a hot mess and it'd be gross inefficiency and we'd be wasting more. Um, at the same time, there this legacy of industrialization that is kind of causing, you know, destroying the planet, or contributing to these uh, a, a massive failure of society and so forth. So, um, you know, again, stamp out one question and into place lots of uh, other little questions, which maybe um, are better source, better source of research, um, better sites for investigation. Um, I wanna say, I don't wanna hold our critics longer than um, one o'clock, but there's certainly time for um, closing uh, comments. I, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it really brief. Um, it was really awesome to um, see the work progress throughout the semester um, and the transition from the beans to the individual projects um, was really helpful to see. Because, um, I mean, we're, we're all talking about the same things here with recycling materials and kind of use, use these things that are commonly thrown away. So whether it's like a hill of beans or rocks or whatever, I think um, it's important to consider like what, what is a metric of success? Like what makes that hill of beans better than like beans dumped on the ground? Or like why, why is this set of rocks the, the right way? I mean, is it... Is it like an aesthetic decision or is it like, is it the tallest stack? Like, what are you, what are you going at? And what are you trying to accomplish um, with these efforts? Um, but overall, fantastic work. Um, and um, I can't wait to see it all presented uh, in your portfolios. Um, thanks. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Nick on just how fantastic this work is and how amazing the images were, the renders compared to the actual kind of physicality of it. Um, and then one kind of occurring theme that I, kept having and I'm not sure it's mainly the goal of this um, studio but it's kind of what we gain from the industry being standardized um, and and kind of how that has increased the accessibility of the building field um, and then as Carrie talked about it in the first half of the review kind of as we approach this new norm or as we break away from the old norm and start to build this new kind of idea of what building materials can be is how can we recreate this new world without any standards um, in order to make it just as accessible as a world with standards is so that we could go into, you know, whatever store, not Home Depot or whatever, but some store and an average human being can then for build something from there, as opposed to have, needing to have this um, expansive knowledge on the techniques. Um, so it's, I'll, I'll be interested to see kind of how we settle on this new ground of what building materials can be. Yeah, great work. I like too the the mix of the history. I think this is Adam probably said this part first. I think part of Riley's answer is looking back at some of that historical research that you started with, like Adam was saying, the hand tools, and that's how how is this material most ex accessible uh, now that we're trying to reinterpret it or um, 
reinterpret our relationship with it or how it interacts with us or how it interacts with the built environment and f figure out how that can become standard. Great work, beautiful. Uh, I laud anyone that takes a material research studio during COVID. <laughs> Um, a few, a few, comments, a few thoughts. I mean, you know, I think it's a really, it's a really productive exercise to start to to just dive in and start to explore the work. And that's what I've seen in the work that I've seen in the last couple hours is people just diving in and exploring something uh, when they don't have answers yet to 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 work with, or even like you know, you're you're working toward identifying even the objective in some ways. And I think that's really important and really healthy work. And um, yeah, I'm starting to think about it maybe historically where, you know, like let's say early 20th century, uh, the, the discipline shifted to mass production, mass standardization. That was a hot button topic, right? Uh, by the time I was in school, discussions were shifting to mass customization, right? So where rapid prototyping technologies were starting to speed up uh, and get us to a point where mass customization could be possible. And I think this studio is questioning both of those paradigms, frankly. And so like, where are we? Where do we land now with the tools that we have available, with the techniques that we have at our disposal? What sort of architecture's relationship to prototype, fabrication, assembly, uh, reassembly, misuse, all of that stuff I think is really fun. And I think like, you know, a, a real objective here seems to be teaching creativity as well. And that's not an easy task, but you know, sometimes you just have to like, just try a ton of stuff and you know, you, you'll learn to be creative and it has to come with discomfort. You know, in an earlier uh, project, I was thinking of Nader Khalili's work. And I don't know if any of you know Nader Khalili, but he was known for a guilt of form uh, clay firing techniques uh, in like the seventies. And so he does this thing called Super Adobe. He died way too young, but his product was Super Adobe. And so he was looking at clay firing techniques. But one of the interesting sort of anecdotes of his work with using like these raw good raw materials was he was approached by NASA to help them rethink ways of colonizing Mars. And the objective there was to not use the natural resources of Earth to go to another planet, but think of how to use the natural resources of another planet so that you can you know, not ship all this, all this mass from one place to another. I'm not saying that's what you're trying to do. You're not trying to colonize Mars, but what your, your objectives, you may not yet see the end, end goals yet, and that's okay. And I think you wanna keep pushing to find what those goals are, and then to be able to reassess and reevaluate along the way so you understand what intelligence you've actually gleaned, because there's a huge amount of intelligence here. And I think it won't be until maybe after the studio is completed, maybe where some of that is really kind of uh, comes into focus, but uh, catalog the intelligence that you're building because it's there. Thanks. Uh, so uh, just maybe switching a little bit gears uh, from what the comments that, that uh, were made before, which I subscribe. Uh, it, mm, it's interesting, um, just maybe making a quick reflection of the fabrication studio. And thinking that the fabrication studio can, on one hand, get something done, which is great, or in the other is to explore uh, new materials, new assembly systems, uh, something that is somehow opposite to uh, getting a final result. Uh, um, in a way, it's almost the difference between getting a salary, going to construction site during the summer or investing your education. Uh, I think this studio is clearly uh, a, an, an educational and an exploration on new things as opposed to, to get something done. Uh, so in that case, it seems to me really interesting to think that that uh, it's bound to failure because if you are exploring, you are testing, and and, and you are failing, and this is our um, spectacular and beautiful failures, <laughs> uh, which I think it brings the most interesting piece. That is, how many questions 
can you make uh, to your explorations? How many things you are finding that are just opening things as opposed to giving you answers uh, and, and allows you to, to, I would say almost the most substantial piece of this studio could be your post-processing of where are, where are all the detours that you have taken that you might have taken in another direction or which are all the other options that, that because you have explored one, you should try these others or what would be the next steps and, and what, is, what are the contradictions of this exploration? Something that you can only do when you are actually testing something as opposed to finalizing a piece that can be submitted to certain assessment. The assessment is in the, in the process of you testing and somehow beautifully failing. You know? so, so I think it's probably this is like the moment in which with a little bit of time, you can, you can do your own post-processing of all this uh, in a different way. And, and it's probably the moment in which you will begin to extract uh, the real uh, learning uh, pieces of, of this semester. So thank you and congratulations. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dean Alde. Um, thank you, uh, Professors uh, Smith and Lyles. Um, and uh, thank you so much, Riley and uh, Nick Lacasse, for joining us. I really appreciate your time um, and um, your range of perspectives and your feedback. I hope that um, uh, all of uh, all of you who took the course um, are able to appreciate the level of dialogue that you helped tee up, um, the level of discussion, which I think was incredibly sophisticated, uh, uh, and perhaps a, a, a level of conversation you might not even be accustomed to. Um, and I think the, the final, those closing comments about this series of, of prying open new questions to me um, and, and sparking, I don't like the word creativity, but I like the word inventiveness, <laughs> uh, but um, those are, you know, uh, those are those can be. They're two sides of the same coin, maybe. Um, prying open new questions and creativity, and I think the for me a defining element in being a leader in the field, uh, not a leader in the sense of you tell someone to do, not a leader in the sense of uh, construction management or something like that, but uh, being a leader in the field, which Again, the two sides of, uh, I have two sides of kind of creativity and inventiveness and identifying questions of value um, and seeing those and running to them, uh, seeing those little veins of, of gold or whatever in the mine um, and, and going to work at them to, to you know, get to the heart of them. Um, and seeing those uh, as, as just something to chase and pursue uh, relentlessly, uh, to me, is the defining element of being a leader in the discipline and the field. And the, the corollary to be scared of them um, is to relegate yourselves to kind of uh, uh, invariably some form of mediocrity, to follow something else to accept uh, as given. Um, I would like you all to stay around, um, but I want to uh, just offer one final round of thanks to the critics again. Um, I really appreciate it personally as well. Um, you helped me understand uh, the work and uh, with new eyes, I have pages of notes that I'll be processing over the next few days. Um, and one final final thanks again to uh, Dean Alde, who really was helpful, not only in um, sticking with us uh, for this um, review, but also in helping set up uh, the studio itself um, uh, and through a series of conversations really honed um, even the, the topic of the studio and, and really it would have been a much different studio and, and much worse studio without those conversations. So thank you so much, uh, Dean Alde. Um, if uh, um, some of the critics um, I mentioned to you uh, in a normal scenario, I'd like to take you all out. Um, but uh, uh, in this situation, I'd like to still try and take you all out. So I'll be on text. Riley, you can join us remotely. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll text or email all of you afterwards. Um, but thank you again. Maybe uh, my um, a virtual round of applause. Mm -hmm.
Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stop, hopefully, the live streaming.